meeting. Uh, before we get to our agenda items, uh, we have an individual that showed up to speak about a minute late, and there's any objection to adding her to the list. Her name is Grace Pouch. Any objection? Okay. Ms. Pouch, we'll add you to the, to the speaker list today. Uh, first item on the agenda, 1.01, minutes of the committee to hold. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is appearance of visitors. We have three speakers. The first speaker, uh, I guess before we speak, uh, <laughs> hold on just a second. Oh, I don't believe I have it. Um, usually, um, no, I don't have it. Yes, I do. There we go. Dr. Stiles will read our rules of engagement for speaking. Dr. Stiles. As each speaker's name is called, he or she will proceed to the podium at the end of the board dais where there is a microphone and a light system. Each speaker has up to three minutes to speak to the board. The light will be green for the first two minutes and will turn yellow when one minute remains on the speaker's allotted time. In keeping with board policy, KCA, abusive language or personal attacks aimed at students or staff members will not be permitted. All speakers are expected to behave in an orderly and respectful manner. The board will not engage in discussion with the speaker or respond to comments. The superintendent will designate a member of the staff to respond to each speaker in an appropriate and timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stiles. Now we have three speakers. The first speaker is Stephanie Johnson. Hi, good morning. First, some words from Sasha and Janu Patton, who was unable to be here this morning. Thanks to Mr. Lewis for requesting a topic of recess for discussion, and to all of you for your time and thoughtful attention to this issue. I emailed you with my thoughts, concerns, and ideas for solutions. I hope they might support your conversation this morning. The Office of Academics is going to suggest more PE as the solution. More PE requires additional staff, building space, and money, and cannot be offered every day. This was mandated by the state in 2005, but has never been funded. More recess has fewer time constraints than PE and only requires that time be opened up in the school day and teachers be given trust and flexibility addressing the standards. Ultimately, we'll need to fix this at this state level. I hope you all will use the leverage available to you as members of this board to work with state lawmakers. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. And my name is Brooke Johnston, and I would like to speak with you regarding the importance of recess from the perspective of a doctor as well as a parent of school-aged children in Greenville County. As a pediatrician, I'm swimming in articles. Children experiencing what used to be overwhelmingly adult health issues, overweight and obesity, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, depression, anxiety, articles about increasing incidence of ADHD and poor social skills among young people, there's abundant proof that physical activity in school can help prevent or treat these illnesses and improve students' concentration, memory, and academic performance. But we can expect even more good from physical activity in school. It can improve health and build critical skills. In practice, I have met young people struggling with decision making or persistent worry or academic challenges some of them had received treatments, even surgeries, to address physical symptoms like chronic abdominal pain related to these difficulties. What these young people were suffering from most was a lack of important skills, such as paying attention, moving with confidence, making good choices without adult direction, advocating for themselves or others, enjoying challenging activities, playing, getting what they needed to take on a new task, and creating space for themselves and others of different groups of people. These are the kinds of skills that young people can begin to develop in unstructured active time in a school community. If we continue to structure school days and homework time so that young people are always directed by adults, mostly sedentary, and often using screens, we will continue to observe increased disease, worsening academic performance, 
and lack of skills necessary for success in academic and other settings, and to do so despite overwhelming evidence that a safe, simple, effective, low-cost solution is available. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Johnston. Next speaker is Catherine Shoemaker. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Katherine Schumacher, President and CEO of Public Education Partners and the parent to two Greenville County School students. Um, thanks, as always, for the opportunity to see you and speak with you this morning. Um, in light of the conversation about the impact of movement and recesses that is on this morning's agenda, um, I wanted to share with you and the administration um, a little research summary that our senior researcher, Craig Stein, who many of you know, um, recently completed. One of our core values at PEP is to use data and evidence to inform advocacy. And in light of the conversations about increasing the amount of free play in our elementary and middle school students, we hope that it might be helpful as a resource in future conversations about this issue in our community. Um, as many of you may know, about four years ago, this was before my tenure at PEP, um, we facilitated a trip to Finland to explore aspects of their successful education system. Unfortunately, Greenville County Schools couldn't be there um, as part of the trip because it happened during accreditation and it was terrible timing and um, not my fault, but I'm, I'm really sorry that that was not possible. Um, but the leadership from Pickens County School District did participate and what they learned has helped shape some pretty big changes at that district regarding to recess and free play time, some of which has been mentioned to this board in the past. And there was an interesting article in the Post and Courier about it recently as well. Um, PEP is also working closely with Greenville County Schools on a pilot program in something called Conscious Discipline, which is a brain-based approach to classroom management that recognizes the critical necessity of regular brain breaks to support learning in our children. Um, and although that's different from true free play, the practices are based on that same connection between physical movement and having the brain be in the right space to learn. Um, what we've shared with you today, and you have hard copies and then digital copies as well, reviews research that has been mentioned by parent advocates recently and provides some summary statements that we as an organization feel comfortable in endorsing. Um, so Ms. Fitzer should be sending you all the digital copies so you can link to some of the research directly. As we emerge from the pandemic and work together to move students forward academically, physically, and mentally, community partners like public education partners, Live Well Greenville, and others are all eager to do our part to understand the barriers to making changing practices and how we can work together to address them as appropriate. We're so grateful for everything you all do, um, as, as well as the administration, to help our children grow and thrive. And as a champion for public education, and of course, as a parent, I'm very grateful. Thanks, y'all. Have a good day. Thank you, Ms. Schumacher. Next speaker is Grace Pouch. Thank you so much. I had Greenville Middle carpool this morning, so I was flying here. Um, they, I'm so happy to see this on your agenda, and I looked at it, and I just wanted to bring up a few points that I hope you'll keep in mind as you pursue the research that you're going to do. Um, the first is that the, all the language that I saw on the agenda had to do with academic achievement, and I so highly value that, but I'd love, you know, if we talk about whole child stuff, I hope we'll take into account the other dimensions of, of even if it doesn't show an academic gain, can we still decide that something's good for the child? That's kind of something I'd like to bring up. Um, so uh, I feel crazy saying that because I'm I've been a teacher. I was anyway. I love academics, so just know that I care a lot about that. Um, the second thing is that um, as Brooke brought up, PE is different than recess, and I totally appreciate investing more into that. Um, my middle schooler has not had a single time for recess yet this year. Um, she does have PE this semester and they do move some in there, but again, it's structured, it's different. Um, she is a straight A student. She has no behavior problems. So I do not need recess for her from that perspective. I want her to have a chance to interact socially and grow emotionally and socially with by interacting with her peers. Um, the third thing is <coughs> I hope that we won't reinvent the wheel and just start the research from scratch and waste time. PEP has research. We have a lot of research. I, I like that item on the agenda, but I hope that you guys will just dive in and put it to use and not <laughs> you know, start from scratch with that. 
And then the fourth thing is that as we, as you guys um, conduct your research, would you please incorporate parents and students into that process? Because I think that a lot of things are um, maybe in place policy-wise, but they're not happening in the in the school. So if you you know, thank you for welcoming us into the conversation in this way so that we can tell you, yeah, they're supposed to have it, but it's not happening. So um, maybe that's a little bit of hangover from COVID times. I don't know. But um, anyway, I'm just so happy y'all are pursuing this. So thank you very much for the chance to to partner with you on it. Thank you, Ms. Pouch. Next item on the agenda is instruction. Ms. Wells. Thank you, Mr. Meek. And it's we've teed up nicely and warmed up for our first item on our agenda. Uh, and under instruction, item 3.01, the impact of movement and recess on academics. Um, this was a, an item that was put on by Mr. Lewis, so before the administration. Uh, Mr. Lewis is shaking his head. Okay, okay. It's been teed up nicely, so uh, <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Lewis, for adding this to our agenda. And Dr. Royster, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Without uh, a great deal of preamble, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeff McCoy and to Andrea Bell, who are going to actually do the presentation regarding this. Mr. McCoy. Um, thank you, Dr. Royster. Um, Ms. Bell is making her way over to the podium um, to um, share with you the presentation and some of the research um, and uh, certainly answer Mr. Lewis's questions as well as we go through the presentation here. So, Ms. Bell. And as a reminder, Ms. Bell is the academic specialist yeah, for health and physical education. The academic specialist for health and physical education. elementary schools state laws and regulations group different types of movement into two main categories when defining required minutes physical education and physical activity many times these words are used interchangeably but they do differ in important ways physical education is a structured instructional program that teaches students the skills and knowledge needed to establish and sustain an active lifestyle Physical activity is all the other movement opportunities provided before, during, and after school. Recess, brain breaks, and movement activities tied to standards that, te that teachers utilize in the classroom occur throughout the school day while various activity clubs and programs like running clubs, cheer squads, and bike clubs are provided before and after school. Greenville County Elementary Schools currently have 45 currently have PE once a week for 45 minutes and 20 to 30 minutes of recess daily. When the South Carolina Health and Fitness Act was established in 2005, the ultimate goal was to provide elementary students 30 daily minutes of movement. In 2006, students were to, or I'm sorry, schools were to strive to reach the goal of 60 of those 150 minutes to be in PE. Then in the years following, work to increase the PE time to 90 minutes. As a part of the Health and Fitness Act, districts are required to report the number of PE and PA minutes by the individual classes and grade level to the State Department each year. Greenville County Schools does, the elementary schools do meet the required 150 weekly minutes of combined PE and PA and the overall purpose of the act of 30 minutes of daily movement. But similar to the majority of the districts in our state, we have struggled to increase PE minutes. Increasing opportunities for physical activity throughout the school day to include learning through movement and active brain breaks is a part of our strategic plan. 100% of our elementary principals indicate that teachers use a variety of movement activities in the classroom as both a teaching tool and brain breaks to help recenter students. 69% of our elementary schools indicate specific optional clubs before and after school that they provide. Active Ed Walkabouts and Go Noodle are two popular web-based active learning platforms that our teachers regularly use. 
Active Ed Walkabouts is a program developed out of Greenville that we work closely with <coughs> to provide movement-based activities tied to our state-specific standards. Go Noodle is a similar program, but it also provides movement activities for indoor recess and introducing and reinforcing life skills. And I'm gonna play that second right. one. The mean, median, and mode. This is an example of one of the videos. Fast like a high speed train. Every time I get a bunch of data sets, I need the triple MR like a vet needs pets. Mean, median, mold, and range. Let me tell it to you clear as cellophane. If you wanna win the map, then you need these tools. Utilize them all, you'll be the big dog at school. Mean is the average, median is the middle. middle. Mode is the number that appears the most. The most. Range is the difference between the highest and lowest. I tell you about it, nerds. Come on, lean and close. Okay, first thing you need to know and better not forget is a group of numbers that's called the data set. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know a data set is numbers in the list. Like a list of everyone's ages, yo, I can handle this. Ooh. Add them up and divide them by how many numbers there are. Then you got the mean. You're like a math star. Orange star is a math star. Yes, he is. Now put your numbers in order from least to great. The middle one's the median. You're cooking like a hot plate. Cooking like a, cooking like a, cooking like a. If there's a number in your data set that appears the most, that number is the mold. Spread that on your math toast. Wait, there's toast? Wait. Of course there is. No, I want some toast. Wait, full grain. Let me get that. Now take the highest number and subtract the lowest from that. Then you got your range. Go and get your cowboy hat. Oh, yeah. oh. Mean, median, mold, and range. Yeah. They're coming at you fast like a high-speed train. Every time I get a bunch of data sets. I okay. need the triple MR like a vet needs pets. Mean, median, mold, and range. Let me tell it to you clear as cellophane. cellophane. If you want to win the map, then you need these tools. Utilize them all, you be the big dog at school. Mean is the average, median is the middle. Middle mode is the number that appears the most. The most. Range is the difference between the highest and lowest. Place of fresh from coast to coast. Mean, median, mode, and range. You're coming at your fast like a high speed train. Every time I get a bunch of data sets, I need a triple MR like a vet needs triple MR. Mean, median, mode, and range. Let me tell it to you, Clara Cellophane. If you want to win a map, then you need these. Get the class. Other physical activities at our element that our elementary schools provide, in addition to the clubs before and after school, recess and activities in the classroom, are school wide and community events like 5K races, booster thon, field days, and walk to school events. Walk walk to school. <clears throat> Several research studies show that physical activity and movement in general increase student achievement, but this is not limited to recess alone. And this includes movement activities embedded in the classroom before and after school, recess, and PE. The national guidance for recess specifically is a minimum of 20 minutes, but recommends additional movement opportunities throughout the day. This slide, this slide shows the number of minutes in various other districts around our state. Jeff, I believe you had this. Most of you are um, familiar with our waivers, and I do want to mention, I don't, I don't know that um, Ms. Bell mentioned this in the end, the video you saw um, while you sat and watched, um, obviously the students, um, the whole point of that video is for students to be up and doing the, the video, moving with the video, so we didn't have you do that, but in a classroom, if you're visiting classrooms, you see those videos playing, the students, whether it be Go Noodle or Walkabouts, the students are actually up doing the activity with the, alongside the video. Um, as you are all are, most likely familiar with. Um, we have innovative waivers. We had three of those um, that we um, got a couple months ago that you all are aware of. 
Um, that is um, the only way really for us, additional recess outside the 30 minutes, the schools are doing 30 minutes, could be added. Um, and really only these three reasons up here. One would be replacing related arts classes with more related arts time. I'm sorry, with more recess time, um, which as you can see there was prohibited by the South Carolina Health and Fitness Act in the section 591010D there. Um, adding time to the elementary school day. Um, in, in some cases, um, our elementary school day is, uh, is other schools or districts may be longer elementary school day. Ours is uh, the six and a half, the required um, amount of time that we are required to have. Um, obviously that would impact um, transportation, particularly if it was on the um, end of the elementary school day versus the beginning of the elementary school day. Um, and then we would have to, outside of that, we would have to seek a waiver from South uh, DE like we did previously with those other three waivers we got to reduce the time spent on the core academics. Um, there are guidelines that require how much time you have to spend on ELA, math, and the science and social studies um, at the elementary level um, as well as middle and high school. Um, so at this time, GCS administration does not recommend any of the actions above those three bullet points there um, as it would be detrimental to our academic and overall development of our students. Um, as Ms. Bell mentioned, we have movement we built. We continue to work with um, walkabouts and other organizations, um, Live Well Greenville and some others to build movement into the classrooms throughout the day, not just as one recess block or one PE block, but rather throughout the day as brain breaks um, as necessary for our students. Teachers do have the discretion to use that as at their, as, at their necessary um, as they see students need those brain breaks. Um, um, and that, so, the um, next slide there, I think um, we had some research, uh, Ms. Bell mentioned in the um, um, slide previously, some of the slides previously, there's a link to the research that um, Dr. McCreary um, and his department pulled together um, as well, if you want to peruse that. There is some summaries in that research, each article that was used, there's a summary on that. Most of those, if you look at the conclusions, we'll talk about the importance of movement and physical activity um, throughout the day for our students. So I think this time we have, um, if there's any questions from you for Ms. Bell or myself. Lewis? No, I, I think you guys were doing this. I think it, it answered some of the questions that have been raised when speakers have come before. If we could go back one slide and just maybe just talk a little bit more about, so, so in order for us to increase the amount of recess time, we, there essentially are three options. Mm -hmm. right? One is that we can replace related arts with recess. And this administration would not recommend doing that because no. why? Well, I think because we have a lot of students who do, there's there's other aspects of the, um, of the whole child, if you will, that is important to explore. Those arts are critically important to explore. The music that sets the kids up for band and music in middle and high school, the art that ultimately sets students up into those pathways is critically important to begin that in elementary school. So, so that waiver, would it would sacrifice art time and related arts time in exchange for recess time. If we chose to go that route, um, if we chose to go that route, yes. So, second option is we can make the school day longer. Correct. Which I believe Legacy is one of the schools near us that has a longer day. Correct. And and we would not recommend making the school day longer because why? Our, the issue with that would be twofold. <clears throat> I believe you cited Legacy as an example, and you're correct there, Mr. Lewis. I believe their school day is an hour and a half, hour and a half longer. Their teachers work an hour and a half longer every day mm -hmm. than our teachers work. Base, their base day is an hour and a half longer. Given our current transportation issues, and even if we were fully staffed, the only way to add time to the school day at the elementary level without ne tremendously negatively impacting class time at or ride time at the secondary level would be to add it at the beginning of the day. So we're at uh, 750, 745 now. So whatever time added to that, which again would add to the student supervision time for our teachers. Even though all teachers are on a base 7.5 hour day, to elementary level their students are there 6.5 hours. That increases middle school, I think the 6.75 hours and high school seven hours. Uh, so there's an issue there and uh, then the third one, I think the, the reasoning there is, is very obvious why we would not seek to waive time away from core academics. Um, you know, without getting into the details, and we can certainly share those with the board if you wish to have them, 
Uh, the schools that are cited as examples of including far more recess time, uh, their academic achievement is far below our academic achievement. So we have a concern there that reducing any time devoted towards core academics would have a negative impact, and particularly in the environment where we're trying to recover missed learning from the pandemic. You know, so we're certainly very pleased that more than 64% of our schools are back to pre-pandemic levels or above, but there's still a number of schools, 36% of them are not yet back there. And the challenge when you get back to that level is we need to, to make up the incremental growth we would have gained over the years between the pre-pandemic and today. Mm -hmm. So we, we have great concern about adding additional time for, for kind of free play recess. We understand the research of activity and how important that is to student development and quite honestly to academic attentiveness. And that's the reason to have all these breaks built into, as Mr. McCoy indicated, you saw the music video on mean, median, and mode. But if you go visit in an elementary classroom, if you spend a, a little bit of time there, you don't have to stay long, you will see various examples of students moving like that, students, some group of students over here moving, some over here maybe sitting and being read to. There's all kinds of constant motion throughout the school day, most particularly at the elementary school level, and that's also true at the middle school level. So I guess that would be my other question, because you know we, we, we talked about PE and we talked about physical activity, but these 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 frame breaks, these videos, um, which by the way, if staff had stood up and done them, I'm sure the board would have participated. We need to model it. We can replay that again if anybody would like to. Uh, um, those, after but those don't count as <laughs> PE time or recess time, correct? So if a if a yeah. teacher who is teaching math stops math instruction from for a period of time to show that video. That's that's still counted as math instruction as part of the number of minutes that she's spending her time yes. teaching that day. We have tried to the videos that we recommend are tied, particularly the um, the well the one you saw, but particularly the um, walkabouts, um, which is locally actually designed from with um, from a professor of Furman here. Mm -hmm. um, those are directly tied to standards. So based on what content you're doing that day, you can search for that, pull that standard up, and actually there's an activity tied to that standard. So that's just another way of teaching math physically, if you will, or movement wise. So, so when we say kids get 45 minutes of PE and 20 to 30 minutes of recess, that that doesn't count the time that a teacher may choose to use these activities no. during their classroom. And it and, and those times are a part of the instruction time. So Correct. when we talk about not, not needing to lose minutes of instruction, teachers could choose to adopt those things and it and it still fulfilled their minutes of instruction time. Correct. Correct. And and how many they use that throughout the day will vary by teacher or as when teachers feel like they need that kids need a break. I mean, they're very, you know, astute, as Dr. Royce just said, when you're I mean, I've been in a ton of elementary schools uh, classrooms since the start of school and you can't really almost spend more than 15 minutes in a classroom without there's some sort of movement activity right. the teacher getting them up and move. It's just so built into the lessons. I mean, teachers have a very built into the, even the lessons they're doing with kids. They kind of know every, you know, elementary age children about every 10 to 15 minutes is normally what we would say based on their age that you need to do some sort of movement activity. So, so when we provide guidance to teachers, are we encouraging them to seek opportunities to provide those instruction related movement times or is this something that we hope that they will find on their own or like what's role yeah. is the district playing in encouraging that? So the State Department actually has uh, provided the walkabouts to our school. I think the entire state now uh, is provided. Now we have other resources built in like the Go Noodles. Um, some teachers choose to go out and find um, things on YouTube. There's a whole bunch of channels on YouTube that do the same thing with play and movement and they certainly are welcome to use those too. We do try to build in some resources to make it easy, but again, certainly teachers can go out and find their own if they choose to do so. Um, and, that, and I will say, Ms. Lewis, while we talked about elementary, the brain break piece, brain break piece is really not just elementary, that's something we promote elementary through high school, um, particularly with a block now at high school that now they may not be doing the mean medium mode video, um, but they're doing some sort of, you know, brain bake stretch, just much like we would adults do in meetings right. that are longer. Okay. Thank you. Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, 
Jeff, the, one of the speakers mentioned, and uh, I think it's referenced in maybe the research, about lessons learned <coughs> in Pickens County from the trip to Finland. Uh, have we reached out to them to see if they have, what they've done uniquely, other than the fact that they're significantly smaller than we are, and they have a little more flexibility? Um, well, Pickens does have a waiver in place because um, they do, um, I can't remember that slide there, I think they're doing, it's not an hour as in some cases has been stated, it's 40 minutes um, when I had the conversation with the chief academic officer over there um, that they increased, but they do have a waiver to reduce instructional time. It's not a, it's not a waiver for recess or PE, but it's a waiver to reduce the instruction, a waiver to reduce the instructional minutes that are required by state um, law. How many, how many minutes did they get a reduction for? Um, I don't actually believe they stated the number of minutes. They just asked, when you state those waivers, you just state, we want relief from X um, statutes or regulations, and then you're granted those. Um, it doesn't necessarily go into the specific minutes. Okay. Back to your third point about seeking a waiver for us as, as a solution, uh, and essentially taking it away from ELA, that's a non or, or essentially core classes. But when you're talking about taking... Uh, whether it's PE or play or recess, whatever you want to call it, away from related arts. Is there a mechanism that would allow a parent to opt in either direction? So my child has X hours that can go either to recess or to uh, related arts. No, or, is that a, or is that a management nightmare for the principal? Well, it's a management nightmare. The other issue is during related arts, that's their planning period. So there's no supervision. There's no option to do related arts or, for example, <laughs> recess to choose that because there's, there's, there's a supervision issue there. Those teachers need to be in related arts PLC planning. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. So there's Mr. Sutta. Compare for me or tell me the difference between recess and physical education. Ms. Bell, that's, I'll let you. Physical education is the structured program where we introduce and work on the fundamentals and the skills that they ultimately will use during, in, in recess, in, in recess. So it allows, it teaches them uh, the fundamentals and, and those types of skills that they then use and, and when they go out and play at recess and stuff like that, are able to do some of those things or modifications of those. but. Physical education is where they uh, are introduced and refine their their motor skills. The physical education that's structured. Mm -hmm. There was recess that's free time. Yes. Between these two activities, what role does the cell phone play in it? Mr. Sutter. Can you use your microphone, please? Comparing the physical education class with a playtime outside, to me, one of the big problems is the cell phone. If I'm going outside and I've got recess, and I'm sitting down and got my nose stuck in a phone, and I keep it in there for the whole time, and to me, that's not really taking advantage of the ability to move or to make progress in my physical activity. It's just simply a, a time where I can sit down and, and amuse myself. So I'm trying to look at academics versus PE. And so when, we, when I looked at, we can't replace a related arts class with more recess time that's prohibited, that the law won't, we just have to change that. And we've already gone through when you try to change the time of the day that the elementary school begins and ends, not only does that just create problems at the elementary level, but also at the middle and the high school level. Mm -hmm. You've already got enough problems as it is with transportation and with buses. If we had maybe 80 more drivers and 80 more buses, then that may not be that big of a problem. So if you thought a waiver, on what basis would you seek a waiver on a core course? 
it would, Mr. Suddeth, it would just be a waiver from the relief of the required instructional minutes per day. And in some cases by content, ELA, for example, is required 90 minutes of instruction per day. So when you seek that waiver, you would be seeking um, relief from not teaching the number of minutes required by state law. Would I add that number of minutes that I took from the ELA to the PE class? You'd have to remove the minutes from somewhere. We would not remove them most likely from ELA or math. It would have to come out of um, probably most likely social studies or science. If, if you added them to the PE class, you'd have to add personnel to teach the classes. Correct. Well, in elementary school, how much PE do they have in a week? One day a week for 45 minutes. So in elementary schools, our students are going 75 minutes per week, and we call that physical education. It's 45 minutes, 45 Mr. Minutes. Sutter. 45 minutes? Yes, sir. I, I cannot understand why we say physical education is just simply 45 minutes a week. How do we explain that? How do we justify that? How we do that? Well, Mr. Sutter, I think, again, there's other interests and aspects. I mean, students are in some related arts every single day in, P in, in elementary school. Um, in, in some sort of, in some classes like STEAM and some of those other classes that involve movement, it's not going to be structured physical education, but PE across the state, and real, in a lot of, most of the country, that's fairly common in elementary that you're doing one day a week. Otherwise, the only other way to get around that if you're going to do it every day is you have to eliminate related arts altogether and just do physical education. I'm being told that more physical education would be a, a boon or improvement to the students as far as academics are concerned. Well, Mr. So Sutter, is, is that true or false? Well, Mr. Sutter, all we can do is based on our own, what we have the data to show, and as, as I think was already mentioned, um, maybe Dr. Royster mentioned, that you know the schools, the districts and schools that were cited before in the past here who have longer recess or a lot longer physical education or daily physical education, their test scores are no no nowhere near where we're performing. The research, when you go back and look at that research, that we have in the presentation, the research focuses on physical activity and movement. I have not had time to look through the research that has been given out this morning, but I would be interested to see how that research coincides with our research within the school district. Let me conclude with Dr. Royster. Would there be a way that you could see where we could have more physical education, more recess, or, or, or is it simply not possible at this time in our structure, in our classroom, our courses? We're looking at it's, it's, social studies. It's not possible at this time in our current structure, and those are the only ways to do it, the ones that are in front of you on the screen right now. <laughs> You replace related arts classes with more recess time. You add time to the elementary school day. If you add time to the elementary school day, if you add it on the end, you're further <laughs> compounding our afternoon pickup and arrival time back home for middle and high school students, which we're already having an extreme issue with due to the driver shortage. Or you're adding it on the front end, and in essence, you're adding, either way you do it, you're adding that much time to a teacher's minimum work day. Uh, the other way is to reduce time spent on core academics. And based on our mean match comparison of schools, the districts and schools where they've done this, they do not any come close to our ac level of academic achievement. So we certainly would not recommend doing that. A lot of the research around this, uh, I believe we're meeting the intent and the findings of it through the physical activity that routinely occurs in the classroom on a daily basis that is part and parcel of core academic instruction without taking anything away from core academic time. 
Uh, Dr. McCreary can summarize the research for you, I feel sure, because he's looked through all of this. Um, you had something you wanted to add, Dr. McCreary? <coughs> Just when we looked at the research, uh, we found a lot of policy briefs, not a lot of research uh, regarding this. And when we did find research, um, it's a, it's really inconclusive uh, regarding the actual minutes that would be most appropriate for various degrees of developmental stages and ages. Uh, the research did point back. Dr. That, McCurry, can you can you speak up? Sure. A bit, or is your microphone on there in front? Of you? So, the research is really the research we looked at was inconclusive in terms of how many minutes per week um, is the, the panacea or silver bullet. It it more worked and defined um, inputs or really uh, outputs as movement. As, Mr. McCoy said movement and physical activity in the classroom, uh, those brain breaks that um, teachers plan for, there's instructional strategies around those types of breaks uh, and movement that's incorporated into learning. Uh, a lot of the uh, information we found was more based on opinion and policy uh, briefings. Some of the research that was used was quite old uh, and and um, so our conclusion is right now that uh, it's inconclusive regarding the number of minutes uh, for um, say PE or some structured activity. <laughs> but what's more important is that students are allowed brain breaks and there's uh, movement and activities going on in the classroom. Without objection, I'm going to extend for 15 minutes. I have several more speakers. Um, Dr. Royster, adding time, I think, would be very, would be a big mistake doing that. So we can't replace the related art class unless we change the law. So if I, am I correct, if we get seek a waiver from the State Department of Education to reduce the time spent on core academics, we would take that from science and social studies, but not from English and math? We don't, we don't recommend that you seek a waiver to reduce core academic time. It would be less harmful, still be harmful, less harmful in science and social studies than English language arts and math because they are both foundational to the other two. Still harmful, simply less harmful. In the period we don't have very much belief that physical education is that important in the elementary school level. I, we, I would. If we did, then we would have more than 45 minutes a week. I would disagree with you on that point. I think the our take on that is it is not so important as to reduce the importance of core academic time or to reduce the exposure to the arts that students receive through their other related arts. So while physical education is important, absent making the school day longer, we don't have a path forward to do that without negatively affecting the other things that are also important to both the academic and development of the whole child. And I understand and I agree with that. Yes, sir. In, in the way I support that. But the bottom line is that we've got to find, we, we look at the core academics. I wonder how we, about the physical fitness of our young people. We, we talk about a lot about the, the core courses, but how, how do we incorporate the physical fitness of our students? Or is that something that is a part of what we should be doing or is it something that should be done in the home? 
Well, I, I think you've hit on part of the answer there, uh, Mr. Sutter. <laughs> <clears throat> One is we want to focus on physical breaks as were described to you and you saw the video about mean, median, and mode by incorporating physical activity into core academic instruction. The other thing, we didn't spend that much time on it, but there's a slide in there, if you'll go to it, Andrea, about before and after school activities. All those things that we have that we provide before school and after school, and particularly, if you look at that bottom one, how many elementary schools now have an extended day program? Jeff, is it 47 out of 51? I think it's 48, but 48, 48. out of 51, for which there is recess provided in a much longer format than during the school day. So you have all those opportunities. And the other thing that you hit on is what do students do when they arrive home? Where, where is the partnership there that we have between community, between home, and between school for students to be engaged in physical activity once they leave school? Now they can stay at school and do some of these other things. We have running clubs, bike clubs, archery, soccer. Uh, we have some movement classes, that sort of thing. Uh, but what about when they get home? And are we doing enough to educate our community as to the importance of students having physical activity when they get home? I just wonder how many minutes would be used, how many calories would a student burn when they're doing class movement as how many calories a student would burn when they're doing a physical education class. See, my, my problem is uh, class movement to me is really not what I would call physical fitness, uh, physical exercise, but I must admit that I am I'm least familiar with the elementary school level than I am with the middle and high school level. So uh, I understand with the uh, elementary school kids, you can't keep them seated anyway, because they're they're always wanting to. They they're full of energy, and every time I go into elementary school, I see that they're they're very active, even when they're sitting in the classroom. Yes, sir. But there's got to be something too, when people are coming to us and saying, you need to do something to improve the physical fitness. We, we've improved the mind. Now we need to improve the body. Thank you, ma'am. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Suddeth. Um, Ms. Leventis Wells. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bale. <clears throat> From one physical education teacher to another who did her student teaching elementary, <clears throat> uh, what is your professional opinion of the daily activity because I believe when I did my student teaching it was once they had once a week physical education and that obviously has not changed over the years there was recess which was and and is this depending upon the schools whether they get 20 to 30 minutes yes okay so is that elementary or middle school no that's all elementary we have 10 schools that have 30 minutes for recess they've worked in 30 minutes a lot of them i, I don't want to say all of them but the majority of them have split it into two 15 minute times breaks right okay. um which i think is fantastic and and i really like the idea of and something that i would want to share to our other to our principals to you know for them to see to if this is an option or you know they oh I haven't thought about that yeah. um, because we know that it's doable in our district with what we're doing we also know that every school is different so leaving that autonomy and that decision up to them but I do think it's important to present that of this is what others are doing along with the various activities um, that they are offering before and after school making sure that we're getting those out um, you know are we actually have a couple of schools that uh, the movement class is another related arts class. Uh, it's not taught by a PE teacher. Um, she is actually, it's, she's hourly, um, but she teaches, you know, they go through yoga and they go through various things. And so they, that school essentially has two 45-minute classes. 
right. can't say two PE classes, I would consider them PE, right. but technically saying we can't, uh, she's not a certified PE teacher. So the so, more we talk, the more information is coming out about what different schools mm -hmm. are offering. It's just left up to the individual schools. Um, so the, the concern that I have then, well, first of all, I love what you've said. The, the setback is there are schools that are only doing 20 minutes, which I feel they should have at least 30 minutes, at least. And I like the way it's broken up into 15 minute intervals, because then the brain can rest, the, kid, the children can play, and then they can re-energize themselves. I, I love that. I think that might be a way to maybe change that offset and, and help these children at the different schools. And I know that we have, what, 52 or 53 elementary schools? 53, including virtual. Yes. And, well, virtual, they should be able to just get up and walk around. <laughs> not so, I'm not, I, I, you know, that's up to them walking around their room while they're watching. You know, my thing is that, that's up to you to get your physical uh, extra activity because you can sit there and just mm -hmm. goof around in your chair <laughs> virtually. But in the classroom, I, I like movement. Um, I like the mean media mode. I can do that. I love that. That was good. I was ready to jump up and just start doing it. But I'm, like and, um, but I do, I, I think when I look at Pickens taking 40 minutes, I, Jeff, how many elementary schools do they have in Pickens? I believe it's four. Three yeah. or four, exactly. It's not like <laughs> what we have. And so I do not want to extend teachers for longer days because they are maxed out as it is. They have a lot on their plates now. I would just like to see different uh, breaks. And we do have a lot of activities before and after school. I know at Stone Academy, I mean, parents walk with their children to school. Mm -hmm. I have done those walks with parents, and, and that's getting the day started, you know, and, um, and that's a good thing. But, you know, in our neighborhood, I'm always seeing children running and taking hikes and things like that. And that's why we've put in so many different roads to schools, streets, and connectors <laughs> where children can walk to school and get that exercise. So uh, with all the activities and field day and things like that, um, I, I would, I'm not sure I would want to take time away from science and social study because then we're so focused on academic <laughs> achievement. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I think individual students need more of certain things than others do. And there are, just like arts, band, et cetera, they have to choose where they're going. But what, would, what is your professional opinion of what you would want to see? I would like, my goal would be to provide as many opportunities so that our schools know what is available to them and what other schools are doing, just like us. And making sure that they understand, you know, an easy resource for the brain breaks or the indoor recess and uh, you know here's a different daily schedule of how you could possibly fit in to 15 minute breaks making sure that they have all of that in front of them so they can see what might work better for them and what they could take advantage of and and really capitalizing on the times and the things that we have in place and making sure that we are utilizing them to the fullest extent um, and making sure that I, of, I love the idea of building on our before and after act, uh, school activities because it's giving those kids those choices of, some, of possibly finding something that they want to continue to pursue outside of the school day. And, and that's ultimately what we want is them to develop that active lifestyle to where they will want to do it outside of 
of school PE class and things like that. And the only way that we can do that is to expose them to different things. Well, I'm very impressed with what you've said. And I know you're going to implement these things. And I know you're going to reach every principal at all of these schools that are only uh, having 20 minutes extended, showing them the importance of at least 30 minutes. And uh, thank you for serving in this position. Thank you. Thanks. Just for a second. So we have we lost our all our 15 minutes, right? We're, we're two minutes left. So I'm going to, I've got four more speakers. I'm going to extend by 15 minutes, but I'm just going to ask board members to be cognizant of, let's make this a fact finding and asking questions, you know, like in that manner and trying to kind of stay tight so we stay on schedule. So, okay, Dr. Royster. <clears throat> just a point of clarification, I think Pickens County has 13 or 14 elementary schools. We want to leave the wrong impression. What is it? They, I think they have 13 or 14 elementary schools. Pickens County. Pickens County. Mm -hmm. Thank M you. Many of them are, are, are small elementary schools. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Stiles. Thank you. I wanted to speak as an insider, um, as a teacher, a former teacher, and as a former administrator, a National Blue Ribbon School, uh, where they focus on arts integration. And I just want to share from my school perspective, and I know that's isolated, but I know that master teachers and master principals, they understand the importance of movement. As a matter of fact, so much of what they do prior to the start of school, including the planning of schedules, involves thinking through that. And, in, and, and reviewing, like as an administrator, reviewing a teacher's schedule to make sure that movement is included, lesson plans. Uh, arts integration is key to movement. Uh, and, and the video that we all watched was an example of arts integration. It's an example of integrating movement with the skills that are being taught. It also increases students' memory and their recall because they're adding another modality, movement, to the curriculum. So I contend that this issue is more about how are, you know, it seems like maybe I'm hearing that there's not confidence in our schools and in our teachers, that they're planning masterfully and that they're integrating the arts and they're thinking through opportunities for movement and brain breaks. I'm telling you that great teachers and great principals and great schools do this. It was a focus at Skyline Elementary, arts integration. So I don't think that any of those options are viable options. I think this is about mastery in teaching and learning. And certainly we can integrate movement into every curricular area. That is a possibility. I lived it every day for many years as an administrator. So I would, my recommendation or my thought would be if we want to, if some children are not receiving that or they're not feeling they're, they're able to move and get their activity, then I feel like maybe we should look at, as a district, developing our teachers, uh, providing development for our administrators on arts integration, ways to integrate movement. Uh, the little video was a great example. They're, they're, they're so accessible for a teacher, and, and good teachers utilize those opportunities. And some teachers, they don't even, they're so skilled in this area, they don't even need those videos. They can do that on their own. It's like clockwork, it's natural. So I would just encourage perhaps that we look at developing our teachers, providing development opportunities for those who, who maybe are not as masterful as some of the others with experience, uh, sharing, uh, best practices uh, in uh, professional learning community meetings, maybe focusing some on how we can integrate movement and activity uh, in our instruction. I think there's ways for that to be done without us looking at any of the three options that were presented on the board. I just don't think those are viable options. And I want to say this too. Students, we have students who excel in all areas, including the sciences, the social studies, music, arts there are some students that is how they thrive that is going to be a part of the career that they choose to be successful in life we certainly cannot <coughs> even consider taking any part of that away from our students 
that would that just would not be appropriate. So I hope that uh, as our uh, coordinator for physical education, I hope that we would look at maybe just providing teachers with resources and information, maybe uh, encouraging our principals to utilize some of their PLC time or professional development time to talk through these issues and work through them and share some best practices. I think that is ultimately the, bat, the best path forward here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Ms. Doolin. Uh, so from a teacher perspective, I remember the very worst day of teaching is a Friday of a rainy week because the kids are just, they've just had it. Um, I recognize how important this is. And I'm hearing a lot that there's minutes required for academics and there's some red tape involved from the state, but how do we find time for assemblies and guest speakers and fundraising during school hours? Where, where is, is there an allotment of time for things like that? Ass assemblies and guest speakers and those things are one-offs. So they're not a regular scheduled every single week taking away from instructional minutes. There's allowances for things like that, the special events that occur. That an annual allowance? There's actually a provision in the, in the EIA for, if I recall correctly, Jason, Jeff, uh, 12 assemblies per year. Not to it, stated in the EIA. I believe it's 12 assemblies plus all of the um, requirements through various regulations and statutes for like um, fire drills and all the other drills that have to take place. But you can have 12 assemblies outside of those things for which we are required to devote time, which is something else that pulls away from core academic instructional time, which is another reason to vigorously protect it. Um, well, so when students arrive, some may choose to go get breakfast, and then if they're, especially early and their teacher isn't in their classroom yet, they're told to just sit outside the classroom and wait. Or I think in middle school they go and sit in the gym and are told literally to sit. So maybe there's opportunities there to not sit even if it's 15 minutes in the morning in the gym, have some basketballs out. I'm, I'm, I mean, as, I'm assuming there are adults in the gym with those students in the morning. There are, and we provide, we actually provide, or you all do through uh, the uh, supplement uh, salary framework, uh, <clears throat> middle schools can provide uh, intramural sports, and some of them do that. Some of these activities listed here are ones that schools engage in before school. Now, again, what you have to bear in mind, if you put students in motion during that period of time, the ratio of student to teacher supervision has to dramatically decrease. In other words, you're going to have to have far more teachers to supervise students in motion than you have to have for students that are sitting, doing their homework, reading. So the venue through which to do that, at least in my mind, is to put in an mural program, and many of our schools do that, because that will then provide pay for somebody to conduct the intramural program. But we got 51 elementary schools, and we got 20 plus middle schools. They're not all doing something different, but they're doing multiple different things that are unique to their school, to their community that provides opportunities for students to move during the day. One of the other challenges, we, had, we haven't really touched on that, but it relates to supervision. The, the older the student, the greater degree of issues that arise from unstructured time. So particularly at the middle school level, that requires a far higher level of adult supervision and you provide unstructured time when you move past the elementary school level. So at that level, we want to be sure that we're doing more of a structured opportunity for motion and movement as opposed to more unstructured op opportunity for, for the same. Well, finally, Ms. Bell, maybe something that would be helpful is if CSHAC put some mm -hmm. recommendations together for this and 
talked with individual schools and this and came up with some ideas and then brought those recommendations to the board yes um, maybe that could be accomplished this year yes okay great thank you thank you uh, madam chairman I would love to forego my questions, comments, recommendations, and I'd love for the chair to entertain listening to the three speakers, give them 60 seconds of our time or per, per piece, and now that they've heard the discussion, give a little feedback from what they heard. I'd rather do that than have my own questions if the chair would entertain them. Well, Mr. Meek, the struggle I have with that is I have um, three more speakers behind you and we've extended already for 30 minutes so I, I can I, go ahead and ask questions so I, I think we should ask our questions and I, what I believe based on what I've heard is I would expect some follow-up another presentation or another uh, action coming out of it so does that do you do you have any questions I do, you have any? I do then okay. um, Dr. Royster, having heard our comments, the other board members' comments today, what is going to be your plan or recommendations from here on out? Our path forward, I don't know that we spent a significant amount of time emphasizing that, but one of the reasons that we have all these things in place now is that our academics group has worked with schools, with principals, with faculties, and done staff development along the lines of the importance of student movement and brain breaks throughout the day. So a lot of that arises out of the existing work that's being done by academics. And quite honestly, I believe that's part of the reason that we continue to see academic improvement. The recognition that opportunities to get a break from simply sitting in a classroom and having instruction delivered to you uh, we have emphasized the importance of moving away from that model for a number of years now. And I think this is what you see the result of. So we would have no reason not to continue along that path. And if we have places that aren't doing this to the level they should, uh, then, then we work with those schools, those principals, to remind them of the importance of doing so. But my experience, much like Jeff's, I think I've been down to 30-some-odd schools since school started. Uh, predominantly elementary schools, that, at least at this point in the school year. Uh, and I rarely went in a class at elementary school where if I stayed there a few minutes, there wasn't motion or movement as a part of the academic. Not, I'm not talking about the in and out of going to lunch or, or out to recess or whatever, but within the academic instruction in the classroom, uh, it were very few classes I went in there more than two or three minutes that there wasn't some sort of movement as a part of the lesson. So I think we're doing a reasonably good job with that. Like anything else, we can always improve and do better and to make sure that our principals are aware of the importance and the impact on student achievement that's, that's gained from taking those breaks. And when you, say, when you call it a break, it's not a break from learning. It's simply a break from the old model of standing in front of the room and lecturing. And We've done, I think, an excellent job moving away from that at the elementary level, and we've done a reasonably good job moving away from that at the secondary level. We still have some, some progress to be made there. Okay, my understanding is that we still, we are currently allowing 15, 20 minutes break time each school day. I believe our 20. recess at uh, 20, to 20. 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. Depending on the reporting school. Per school, every day? Yes, sir. 20 to 30 minutes? Yes, sir. Now, that's recess, not not including their PE time or anything else they might do that involves movement. Recess being defined as getting out playing. Yes, sir. Going outside, unstructured play. Okay. Andrea, that's your definition as well, right? <laughs> okay. The, the problem I've always had being one of those students when it comes to recess time, because I was up wandering around what they were doing in class, I got to stay in at recess. Do we still keep kids in recess that we're not behaving, you know, uh, during the school? So they're allowed to go out? Yes. Everyone. That yeah. is not our, it is not our policy to do that. So if somebody's doing that, they're not following. I'm glad policy. to hear that. Well, thank you very much. That's all my questions. 
Um, Ms. Bush. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we, we've gotten some great information today, and it's amazing when we share. I want to thank uh, Ms. Bell and also uh, Mr. McCoy for um, doing a great presentation. So it's amazing what we when we share. So I can only think that the fact that if we do a better job of it, sharing throughout our district is how um, um, is how you can go those two 15 minutes and how it how you how those principals can work that into their schedule or if they need help or resources working that into their schedule the importance of that and I think that that time consistency is is just as important as that schedule because I would hate to think that a child that was used to that that 15 minutes twice a day and then just because of a move and they move from school A to school B that all of a sudden now they're it's almost like they're being deprived of something that we were able to offer to them before um, I, the one of the you know some of the best things I've heard this morning um, besides being able to see all the opportunities that we offer um, is the uh, is the word choice and and students having those choices and parents having those choices and um, and I mean actually listening to a principal that ran a blue ribbon school I mean she's we, we solved it all right here um, just just listening to those words of wisdom um, and uh, that I think that that that's the focus right there is is making sure that we put the resources in place to develop that mastery in teaching and learning and and how close that has to work with those uh, different opportunities during the day um, to have to be able those elementary schools to work that extra 15 minutes in I want to talk a little bit about something Mr. Meek just touched on, but it's very, it's a very important um, aspect of all this. And I worked on it. I think I was on the instructional uh, when we redid the, you need to extend time. I do. I do. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to extend for 15 more minutes without objection. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. When I was on the instructional committee, we worked on uh, a, Policies Committee, we worked for like a year and a half on uh, policies impacting instructional time. And one of those policies that we had great discussion about, and I had concern, you know, and I'll be the first to admit, I was a room mom back before my, during my PTA days, before my board <laughs> service, I was a guilty room mom that provided cupcakes and cookies. Um, and so, uh, I would like to say that you know now I have uh, converted, and and it still concerns me that teachers use sweets, chocolates, bubble gum, things like that as a reward. And I know that um, we don't have a policy that covers that. Um, we don't have a policy that covers um, using recess as punishment. Um, I, you know, I was horrified when I had an employee come to me and say her middle school daughter, she went home in the evening and said, let put your sneakers on, let's go take a walk. And she said, what am I being punished for? What did I do wrong? And from, from her time in elementary school, she was taught that if you have to walk, that's punishment. And, um, and I just want to, if it, if it, you know, and I, I remember having this discussion with Dr. Royster and us talking about administrative rule versus policy. Um, and, I, and I think that some of those things are handed down and it's because that the resources are not there and those teachers are not being helped to master those opportunities to where they say, well, it's worked for me on the test for 18 years that I threw Kit Kat bars out when they got a question right. What can we replace that with? We want to make sure we have those opportunities, much the way we kind of uh, we we worked with that change in 
in like our high school concession stands when I think Livewell came up and said, here are lists you can go to Costco and Sam's and you can buy these items. We have a list right here that you can have opportunities so that when you go to a ball game, you can make the healthy choice or you can make the unhealthy choice, but at least you had, there again, you had a choice of what to choose. Um, I would like for those, I, I would insist that we, um, is this the time, Dr. Royster, that we need to, to do something stronger? I think that we have teachers that are still handing down that, or is it, should it just be handled on a basis because no parent wants to, no when you have a good teacher, other than the fact that they're handing out candy, and you think about those kids that are challenged now, the, the students, we have so many that are diabetic, so many that are allergic to, to different um, items, that we want to, we're putting those parents in a position, go and tell the principal that your teacher is giving out, is giving out candy. And um, so how do we, how do we move forward with those opportunities to, to, to make sure that, that recess is not being used as punishment? I know they're allowed to go to recess, as Mr. Meek asked, but are they being punished by being told you have to walk laps? at recess they should not be <laughs> that's well, i mean the, if, if that's an issue we need to first understand the scope of the issue and the only way to understand that is if people share that with us uh, in other words it affected my child this way and we expect principals to follow the expectations we've set out for them and if not using recess as a punishment is one of those we expect it to be followed so we need to know if that's not happening okay. um, you might learn that by observation Every member of this district leadership team, not just the ones sitting in here, ones that aren't sitting in here today, visit uh, three to five schools a month. Felt. So there is some observation of what goes on in schools. But there is no way that we can be in every school every day, all day long. That's not physically possible, nor should it be. We should be able to trust the leadership we have in place. It's not necessarily possible for a principal to be in every teacher's class every day though they should be there frequently, and even in our largest schools, at least weekly, to get an idea of what's going on. So we may need to remind them that you don't do these things. That's against our procedures, against our processes. Uh, but as you know, with your many years of experience on the board, so often we hear stories related anecdotally that would lend, lead one to believe something's widespread when in fact it's not widespread. So we need to address the exceptions when we find that they exist. Cre creating, and certainly we need to have, we have to have rules and policies and procedures, particularly given our size, but a school system of any size has to have rules and policies and procedures. But just enacting more rules will not cause people to behave in the way necessarily you desire for them to behave. We need to ensure that uh, we fully communicated what we want people to do what the expectation is and why that's important. Just like there's all kind of research that supports that Dr. McCreary can share with you, Mr. McCoy can share with you, that those kinds of activities that you saw to mean, median, and mode and hundreds of others that are available out there both incorporate some physical activity for students, but they are grounded in research that that imparts the message about in that case, mean, median, and mode. Uh, if you didn't remember what that was, it's probably stuck in your mind right now. So, I mean, it's highly effective. We don't really necessarily want a physical demonstration. Somebody, in the, somebody over there that doesn't, maybe not as attuned, they're no telling what they would end up looking like. Um, but it imprints that in a student's mind. For for a lot of students, not every student, but for probably even most students. And there's multiple approaches, as you all know, all of you, different students recall things in different ways. For some students, if they were to write something down, you told them the mere act of writing it down calls, causes them to recall it. Then they may even have to read it again. Others, they may have to go back and read it 10 times. 
Dr. Royster, I'm going to interrupt you because I think you answered her question. Okay. And I, we've got some other questions. Um, we're running late on time. And I know that workshop that we're going to do after this meeting is really important to have time. So if, I, if I could just, um, yes, but Ms. Bush, do you have any other questions? Okay. Thank or? you. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Uh, Ms. Morrison Fair. Thank you. I just want to summarize. I really appreciate uh, what some of my colleagues have said, starting with uh, Dr. Stiles and Ms. Bush, and of course, Mr. Southerth over there. I don't think it's anyone in this room that does not believe in creating movement in the classroom, especially if you've been in education for any amount of time. You need that in order to be successful in your classroom, regardless of what grade level you are in. So I just want to say I appreciate what Greenville County has done. I think what we need to do, because people come and they look at us and they think, well, we don't have recess or we need this. But as I listened to the report this morning, every way that you go, there's a roadblock. So it comes back to a roadblock from the state. We certainly want to require our teachers to stay longer. We have a problem with bus drivers. Before and after school activities depend on parents having transportation to make sure students get there and get home. So it all boils down to creative instruction and deliverance of instruction in the classroom. I think Greenville County is doing a great job. I salute them, but I would like to say, hanging my hat on what Mr. Southern said, we need to have parents in the community educated that they need to partner with us to make sure that their student has a successful experience, educational experience, in Greenville County, and I think they can do that. I just think it's a matter of education. We need them when students go home, we need them to also have recess and participate. And Mr. Southern said something about the cell phone. I watch students even being picked up in the carpool line, and the first thing they do is grab that cell phone. Nobody talks about taking students to the park after school. So I just wanted to weigh in on that. I appreciate Greenville County, everything they've done. Staff, you've done a great job. Thank you very much. That's my comment. Thank you, Ms. Morrison Fair. So we have Ms. Mosley, I guess, on Zoom, as I understand it. And she had a question as well. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Rita. Um, sorry, everyone, I'm a little under the weather today. I sound a little froggy, but um, I'm listening. This has been a great discussion. A couple of my questions have already been addressed. So I'll skip those. But I did want to, first of all, comment on what Dr. Stiles said. I think he was spot on. I think as a parent often feel that there is a disconnect in believing a, from a district level what is going on in our schools and what is actually going on in our schools. So I would like to encourage the district to reiterate to leadership, administration, as well as teachers, how important this topic is, particularly movement throughout the day as our schools. I feel certain there are teachers that are masters at it, and I feel certain that we could do better in some classrooms. So that is my comment on that. I do have a question about indoor recess. So, um, Ms. Doolin alluded to the rainy day Friday afternoons, which are, you know, not fun for any teacher. What are our guidelines about screen time? I know that that was a concern of several of our speakers. Um, substituting. You know, when we're stuck inside, you know, screen time for that for that movement opportunity. Because I think you were asking about you're a little bit hard to hear, but you were asking about how we handle indoor recess. Yes, and the screen time. Like, what are our guidelines? Because I, okay. I know that was a concern from some of our speakers, and it's frankly a concern of mine that we now that we've migrated to Chromebooks so much. Screen time in general is a concern of mine. How much are we substituting? Screen time during in, like during indoor recess when okay you know. yep Mr McCoy or Dr Ross I believe right. you had the yes we encourage indoor recess we encourage um, getting up movement not using the Chromebooks there's a lot of opportunities uh, when we use Go Noodle for an indoor recess type thing that's being done up on a Promethean board they're not using their Chromebooks in order to do that. Um, just might have a teacher that isn't used to doing yoga or something like that. So they've got somebody up there that's doing it professionally with some good music. Um, but we don't 
we don't encourage and I'm working now and kind of putting some things in writing where, you know, not assuming that our teachers understand the importance of movement and stuff like that in during those times and giving those them those options and you know this is not a time for for Chromebooks or for them to to be on any type of device in that way they need to be up and moving around so uh, I absolutely agree um, and we need to get those things and just kind of put all those things back out in writing so that we don't assume and we have something to refer back to and providing them a number of different options that they can do, whether it is using a Go Noodle or something like that, or getting back to the basics of playing. You can play Foursquare and you know little things like that by just moving around a few desks. Um, so it's it's keeping a good balance of those things um, available to them. Okay, I do like that idea. Now, can someone clarify for me? We talked a lot about elementary school recess. Are our middle schools, I know some middle schools dismiss the students, or at least when my son was in middle school, they dismissed the students halfway through lunch to go walk outside. Are we, do we do that consistently in all middle schools or is it left up to the school? That, that's a school level decision. Dr. McDonald could speak more, more closely to that, but some schools do allow a period of time at the end of their lunch period to go outside. Uh, Dr. McDonald. Sir, I think right now we have um, just over half the schools have some kind of time unstructured after lunch. So students may go out and walk on the track in some places. Uh, in others, they may just go outside for a few minutes of fresh air. It's not a long time, but there are most of our schools providing now that time. Okay, I would like to see that encouraged more. Um, to Mr. Sutton's point, if kids are on their cell phones, um, that sort of defeats the purpose. Do we have any kind of, I don't think we do. My children attended a charter school where cell phones were basically banned until uh, pretty much at school. We don't do that in Rainbow County Schools, is that correct? No. We do not have a blanket ban on cell phones. Some individual schools regulate that the way they choose to regulate it. Even down at some cases, the individual classroom level uh, where teachers uh, either allow or don't. Uh, going back to a time, uh, I was trying to remember how many years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago when we fully prohibited phones in schools at all. And then we allowed it uh, with by action of the board at that point uh, as I recall, based on the idea that students would have the ability to utilize that in an instructional way. I'll extend for 10 minutes without objection. Since that time, we have become a one-to-one -one district. We were not at that time. So now every student in this district, regardless of grade level, has a device. So we can become more restrictive about cell phone utilization. And I think individual schools have become more restrictive over the last two to three years uh, in, in regards to that. Another thing, the point I think important, important to make about screen time, students are gonna have far more screen time now than they did before because almost all our text are Chromebook based text. So they're gonna have what would have before been textbook time is now going to be, you're going to see them accessing that through a Chromebook, which is, we don't want to, just like we don't want to overuse textbook uh, time, we don't want to overuse that either. And I'll, Mr. McCoy. And I'll just remind, um, I don't remember when we did it in here, um, the updated research coming out, um, well, of COVID, but even pre-COVID was more less about the amount of minutes screen time as much as it was about what kids were doing with the devices. There's more emphasis on that through the research on the impact passive screen time versus active screen time um, with the current research we shared with the board. I don't remember when that was, maybe last year um, with you guys. Leslie, is there anything else? Just one last comment. Um, I, I've heard a lot of what we can't do, and I understand a lot of that is driven by um, directives, requirements, whatever, at the state level. At another time, I would love to hear if there, and maybe this is an offline conversation of what we can do as a board, as a member, as a parent. Um, because I do think with us now being, to Dr. Royster's point, everyone now does have a device. 
everyone does have access. I mean, we are doing more screen time, online textbooks, for example. Our educational, I guess, modalities are changing, and so I'm just wondering if at the state level, we need to revisit some of these requirements so that we can then have a more balanced day for our students. So that's all I have to say. Thank, thank you, Ms. Mosley. Um, Mr. Suttoth has one more comment, and then I'm, I have a couple of questions. Mr. Suttoth, you have no, a comment? It's a, question. it's a question. Can you put this back up, the physical education, physical activity requirements? I think it's the third one. Third one. That one. That one. Dr. Royster, on the point here the 2006 schools will make 60 of the 50 minutes to be PE. Could you please let me know how well we did that, how successful we were? I just want a brief summary of, of, of how close we got to that, what we started in 2006. And the second thing, it says that all districts are required to report. So I'd like to see a sample of a report, but I don't want us to go to a lot of stuff in that regard if we got 52 elementary schools we got 52 reports we have one we have one report we submit to the state do you have to submit them individually andrea or you submit a compilation a google form they uh with the exact questions and then i have one spreadsheet with each school tabbed on it and so and then i have a, a summary tab so we'll we'll send you that the short answer to your first question is uh we are between 20 and 30 minutes of the 60. The state have basically abandoned that because it was contingent upon full funding and they've never funded it. They partially funded it, then they dropped the requirement. They basically dropped the requirement because it. the law says, as it indicates there, all provisions of that are contingent upon funding from the state. So we never got 90 minutes weekly? No, sir. We got kicked out with 45 minutes weekly? Um. Yes, sir. All right. We might have some some isolated case somewhere where we have more than that, but generally speaking, the most we would have gotten would be 45, minimum 30. Okay, well, then 206 is really a moot point now. The physical education, if you just give me a sample so I can get, try to understand what we're talking about. See, we've got here physical education and physical activity. And you know, it says we've got to report that, but then the last one right here, it says we, as far as the physical activity is done, we're doing very well, but we struggle to increase the PE minutes. Yes, sir. And I was wondering what, what has, I'd like to, an explanation as to what the struggle has been about. Don't have the money to pay for additional PE teachers. If you could give that to me in writing. Yes, sir, we're glad to. Oh, very briefly, I'm not looking for any large stuff. That's all I have done, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suttoth. I think this has been a great um, conversation, and I think every board member has commented on it, which I think is, is wonderful. Um, you know, I, I would say I think the point of the research, as I thought about it, wasn't really to say that to compare our academics to theirs and their time to ours and to say, well, we're performing better, so we don't need to do the same thing, but gosh, maybe we would perform better based on the research. Our, our high academics would get even higher if we incorporated this this activity and research so just it's easy to correlate and say well we're doing better academically they need more time they're using more time and aren't doing as well academically but there's a lot of other factors in there um i also think the activity we talked a lot about activity in the classroom and the brain breaks which really are dot royster said it a couple times they're still learning versus just downtime just to think about whatever you want to think about and to talk to your friend about whatever you want to talk about without getting in trouble. So I, I think there's a lot of different things in this, this mix. Um, to Mr. Sutter's point about this Health and Fitness Act, I guess, Dr. Royster, what you, what you really, if all the provisions of the act are contingent upon funding from the state, then we really don't have to follow any of these mandates. You still have to follow the basic PE requirement that existed before the expanded time. That was before the Health and Fitness Act of 2005? 
Yes. Which is what? Uh, thir 30 minutes a week, I believe. Well, we can get that to you. Yeah, so so I, I guess just in thinking about, and I think this is a great strategic planning discussion, you know, when you get to that point, and great for the CSHAC to, committee to follow up, but thinking about how you deliver PE differently, I think Mr. So said that, and, and maybe there is a different way if it's 15-minute increments. For, for kids to get the recess, or maybe if you can stretch PE out instead of making it part of a related arts, if you change the structure of the day. It just seems like when you look at these requirements from the state, and based on what you said, Dr. Royster, it looks like our school day would have to be longer to accommodate what the state is asking us to do. So if we don't believe that's viable, I think it's a good time to say to the state, here's another regulation that's in place that is counter to funding being provided and other things we're trying to do and get some of these things off the books. So maybe that's something for the advocacy committee to work on. Um, and then I, I appreciate what you said about it's really what's happening in the schools and we're gonna communicate with the schools, but I think all these, the folks that have come and talked to us that are big advocates, I would suggest maybe school improvement councils working collectively, um, talking with their schools and figuring out what the right answers are, the best answers for how we make changes have come from the school level up. So I would hope that this conversation is going to spur a lot of different actions to have, you know, have an impact in allowing more activity for our students. So with that, uh, there was no action, even though maybe there be, would be some things come out. Um, Mr. Meek, I would say to you, if you would like to have follow up, certainly Cal's another opportunity um, to do that, or you could establish a committee if you want. Um, our next item on the agenda, and I guess thanks Mr. Lewis for bringing it to the attention. There's obviously a lot of people were interested in it. We're going to move to 3.02 innovative course approvals. So this is coming to the board with a recommended motion from the administration to approve the local board courses as being presented. Do I have a maker of the motion before Mr. Meek? Madam Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve the local board courses as presented. Do I have a second? And I have a second from Ms. Doolin. So, um, Dr. Royster, would you like to speak to this or have Mr. McCoy speak to these items? Mr. McCoy, is there anything in particular you need to note about these items? Uh, there's a detailed yeah. explanation in the final column mm -hmm. uh, in your board documents. But Mr. McCoy? Yes, most of these, um, just two, two notes there, most of these are additional honors courses that we've been talking about the last couple of years adding as our, our school, our teachers and our committees have time to review and build those honors level courses with the South Carolina rubric, honors rubric. Um, I will just point out the calculus to math lab that's actually um, part of the um, governor's school um, for the engineering um, program, we have a jail man. So that is a specific um, coming from them as part of that curriculum um, in that um, engineering program there. And then the band and orchestra is simply additions due to the fact that we do offer um, eighth grade now can receive high school credit for band or orchestra. And so now we just need to add that one last level so students have the opportunity to take it basically all four, all eight semesters in high school plus the eighth grade um, middle school course. Yes. Mr. Sutter. I'm looking at the instrumental music band and instrumental music orchestra. And I know they participate in a number of concerts. Would there be a way where the board could be invited to one of these concerts or sometime during the year? Because they are really truly we, instrumental we, we geniuses can. really when you think about it. And especially you got one in band and you got one in, in orchestra. And I know they stay here, they listed all of these auditions and pro programs. I just would like to see something to make sure that the school board could have an opportunity to visit or, or to observe it, if that's possible. Yeah, Thanks, yes, sir. As, as a reminder, we invite the board as a group to the Youth Symphony, which is comprised of our students. Uh, you receive an invitation to the countywide band uh, competition, which occurred, I believe, about a month ago. Yeah. It was occurred last month, uh, and several other things. We also, and we, we'll send a reminder to schools to do so, we encourage the schools to invite board members to their individual concerts. We don't coordinate those individual concerts at the district level and the invitations to them. 
for one, they're, they're too numerous for us to try to keep up with. Better for the invitation to come directly from the school, but we'll send a reminder, Ms. Fitz, for Will to them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to ask one question, Jeff. The Calc 2 Math Lab honors, we had a math lab already? Or is this the, is the honors, are we only offering at the honors they level? Only, the South Carolina Governor School for that engineering program is only offering at the honors level. Okay, and that's okay with the state? Yeah, um, they technically have the CP level course. The South Carolina Governor's School has a CP level course. Um, but for but the only thing they offer is the honors level for those students. It's kind of like um, certain courses they only offer dual credit for. Okay, and that's a precursor to taking the class and it's a half credit. Is it, it do they only do it? Has, do they only do it a quarter, or they just get half? How does that work? I noticed it was a half credit. I believe they only do it a quarter. Um, I do know that because if you remember that program is via distance learning, mm -hmm. it's a little bit more flexible with scheduling sometimes on what they can do. Um, they technically can offer it if they chose a minimum. You know, they could offer it technically for a whole semester, so to speak, at a reduced time um, because that scheduling in the uh, high school with that. Um, with that program is very flexible because it's mostly distance learning at that once you get to 11th and 12th grade it's almost all your courses are being done through that distance learning program. So are, are any other schools following the same sort of idea that before you take even if it's an ap calc two course that you're doing some sort of preparatory it just seems like maybe they we, we would get better performance out of our students for these yeah. really difficult classes there are some courses that have ap preps um, what they are offered at credit wise does sometimes the state does dictate that okay. um, like for IB courses um, they can't be offered at that IB level they have to be offered at one level below which would be the honors level for right. them so right. the state does dictate okay. some of those credit requirements okay great um, are there any other questions all right hearing none the motion on the floor is to approve the local board courses as presented all in favor of the motion please say aye aye any opposed the motion carries. Mr. Meek, I didn't do a great job of keeping us all tight and on time and on topic, but I will turn it back over to you. Maybe Mr. Sailors can do a better job with the administration portion. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Thank you. <laughs> that completes our uh, instruction part of the agenda. Next part is the administration. Mr. Sailors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first item on the agenda is item 4.01, bullying prevention and responses. Uh, this item was placed on the agenda at the request of Mrs. Leventis Wells, who uh, Linda will call on you for comment first once uh, the administration makes their presentation. So, Dr. Royster, would you like to tee it up? Mrs. Leventis Wells, have any comments? Right. Okay. Uh, no, I'll oh, wait okay. after the presentation. Uh, I'll simply turn it over to Dr. Ward. He's going to go through with you our policies, our processes and show you how, for example, a complaint received through various uh, mechanisms is handled once it's received. Dr. Ward? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, we're talking about uh, bullying prevention and our response as a district and what parents will need to know to help combat bullying. I guess in the first place, um, the best way to combat bullying is prevention. So we do have some programs in place, and this is just a small sample of the types of programs that we have in place at our schools and throughout the district to help, um, number one, identify bullying and to uh, prevent it and to combat bullying. Uh, schools participate in Stomp Out Bullying, which is a long-term uh, program and organization that's uh, geared towards um, combating bullying, whether it be the traditional form of bullying or cyber bullying that is prevalent now. Um, our district, with the, through our wonderful ETS um, department, has been given the distinction of a champion of cyber, cyber security. And that what goes with that distinction are some of the topics that we uh, address include uh, anti-cyber bullying, as well as social networking interaction and uh, inappropriate posting. So we're addressing uh, issues with um, how students um, interact on social media and, and um, through the internet. And obviously that is something difficult for even adults to deal with, much less students. So um, also schools have uh, participated in the PBIS, which is the Positive Behavior Intervention and Supports 
and several schools have earned the uh, rec the recognition of the recognized ASCA model program or ramp awards. And this is the ASCA is the um, the American School Counselors Association, and they uh, recognize schools who um, counseling programs who have a focus on uh, preventing bullying in schools as well. So we also provide trainings for staff each year. Staff. Um, participate in um, our safety videos. And one video in particular is our Title IX and our Safe Schools Climate Act. And this video um, and is, is a requirement every year for all staff. Uh, this uh, video covers um, how to um, address bullying when staff uh, sees it or notifies and who they should notify and how the uh, school should respond to um, when they receive a complaint or a report of bullying and that all ties in with our district policy as well also you've heard um, presentations on our social emotional learning or SEL training and staff also receive um, trainings on SEL and this training should um, it helps staff to um, help students and how we address bullying and how to uh, identify it and much less to have tolerance for all people so uh, ways to uh, report bullying, we provide a multiple, um, a multitude of ways in which um, bullying can be reported. Uh, first and foremost is that, that, old, that good old fashioned way of just going directly to the school administration and uh, reporting it directly to the admin at the school, um, either through uh, in-person visit or phone call to the principal or um, email to the school. Uh, another, another way, um, we have uh, ways in which uh, bullying can be reported anonymously. Uh, students, when they open their Chromebooks and log in, it goes to the uh, home page of the school. Uh, they have uh, access to report bullying on, the, uh, on their Chromebooks as well. Um, we have the GCS bullying hotline, uh, and, and that's the number up there, 864-794-6821. You can call or text this number and uh, report bullying that way. Or you can email uh, speakup at greenvilleschools.us is a, uh, another form of um, reporting bullying. Also, um, parents can file a formal complaint, uh, and that is a form that is on our website, and we'll show you all of those things later. So we, um, as a district, um, we have what's called gaggle. Um, and you may be remember that we've uh, implemented gaggle in the district. Um, when, if you research gaggle, you'll find that um, other people have described gaggle as as that um, kind of a security blanket um, or a guardian of the district that works in the background. And gaggle monitors all of our district platforms. Uh, they they're searching for keywords. And um, they'll flag keywords, and then they issue some gaggle alerts based on the, uh, the wording or the topics in the uh, in those alerts that they, or when they flag those uh, keywords. Uh, and it can be anything from something very serious to something that is not necessarily an issue, but they flag the keyword. For example, I recall. Uh, being a principal in a former district that used Gaggle also, I would get reports when uh, students researched a book report on To Kill a Mockingbird, and just because it had the word kill in it, then that would flag that search. So a principal would have to read those those uh, alerts and, and then uh, make a judgment on whether to investigate or not. So with the um, Gaggle, uh, any issues that are identified in Gaggle uh, the alerts, they're often sent to administrators, counselors, and or the uh, district ombudsman. Um, any imminent situations of self-harm or harm to others, uh, that report goes directly to our director of security, Travis Forrester, who will then follow up with that report to the uh, appropriate personnel. We also have a security specialist, Chad Jordan, who monitors that uh, those uh, gaggle alerts as well, and he will disseminate those as needed. Um, if we did, when we did a keyword search from last school year, 
Um, we had 774 alerts uh, in Gaggle that with that keyword search of bullying in it. So we can uh, go back and look at reports for um, all of our Gaggle alerts. Typically, Gaggle alerts, we, we classify them in three different levels. That level one is um, it's called possible student situation or PSS. Those are alerts with threats to self or to others. And uh, those are the reports that go directly to our director of security, who will then um, make the appropriate actions for those. Uh, level two are called questionable content or QCON. Um, these are possible bullying situations and or inappropriate searches. Uh, when the um, security specialist monitor those reports, he can at some point uh, elevate that. If, um, if Gaggle misclassifies it, then we have a second line of defense. And if that is something that needs to be elevated to, um, to a level one, it can be done at that time as well. And then it will also uh, disseminate those reports to the appropriate personnel to investigate. Uh, level three is uh, simply called a violation, and that can be bad language, uh, inappropriate searches, or um, uh, inappropriate pictures, or things like that on there. And they kind of, they can be um, anything like I described earlier. Uh, it could be just a, um, a mis, uh, misclassification if they were, students were searching something that had a, a key word that it would flag in it. So um, we sh I've showed you all the ways in which uh, parents and students can report bullying. So what happens when bullying is reported? Um, typically, uh, when it's reported directly to a school administration, uh, <coughs> per policy, the administration will have to investigate promptly and thoroughly in accordance with our policy. Uh, the student and his or her parents are notified and informed of the results of that investigation. Uh, if any inappropriate conduct is, has been determined to have occurred, then appropriate action is taken at that time. And any disciplinary action, whether it be for students or staff, would be uh, per law is obviously confidential. So when bullying is reported via the hotline, either call or text or email, again, that report goes through gaggle and then that report is then disseminated to the appropriate personnel, whether it be the ombudsman or, again, the school administration. Um, ombudsman, Dr. Fitzpatrick or Dr. Skipper, they will take appropriate action as well. Um, they will notify the schools and, and or the parents. Um, and also, um, the, um, the complaint is then investigated at the appropriate levels. So, and as I said, we also have a formal complaint form per policy. Uh, if a formal complaint is filed, that formal complaint, um, the ombudsman notifies the complainant and the school that the re that, that report has been received. Uh, at that point, we have 10 school days to uh, investigate it. And then a written response is provided to the parents and the school. This is kind of a flow chart, and I'm sorry, it may be a little bit difficult to see, uh, difficult to see for me as well without my glasses. So, um, a report that goes through Gaggle, uh, if it is a PSS report or um, one that uh, goes through our director of security, um, he will get those and then he will distribute that to the appropriate personnel. Uh, if it is a report of self harm, or anything like that, he notifies um, law enforcement to do a well check on the student as well. If they're in school at the time, um, they, they will also notify the school administration. But if they're out of school at that time, um, Ms. Uh, Travis Forrester will notify law enforcement to do a well check at the home. Uh, and the follow up um, from that is uh, when the fine is. The outcome, excuse me, of that situation is the student will either receive the support and services they need, um, or if it's uh, a report of harm to others, then there may be some uh, legal and or disciplinary action that will need to take place at that time. And those findings are, of course, are reported to the parents in the school. 
um, and is also noted that um, if parents disagree with the findings, they do have an opportunity to appeal those findings to the uh, appropriate levels. Now, with situations of the QCON and or violations, again, during the school hours, those can go directly to the school administration, as well as the security specialist who monitors the account can make a decision whether to elevate that or not. Um, that those are, in which case the school admin or ombudsman can, will investigate that complaint or that alert and there, those findings again are reported to the parents in school and again parents still have the uh, opportunity to appeal those findings as well. Now any QCONs or um, violation reports that come in after hours, again the security specialist is monitoring that account and can forward those along to the appropriate personnel and will follow the same process as in the other ones. In the event of a formal complaint, um, there are two situations. If that complaint is not against school admin, then school admin will investigate that uh, complaint and then they will uh, provide the parents uh, the fi those findings of that investigation as well and they will do the appropriate action if inappropriate conduct has occurred. And again, if parents disagree with the findings, um, they can appeal those findings to the ombudsman at that point who can then investigate and provide their findings. And, uh, and then the uh, parents can also appeal up to the superintendent's designee. Um, if a complaint is against school admin, then those will go to the ombudsman and the ombudsman will then uh, investigate and again, provide the findings to the parents and school. And if, uh, again, if either in appeals, they, will, they can appeal to the uh, school's uh, supervisor or the appropriate uh, department uh, supervisor at that point. And appeals can, again, go up to the superintendent's designee. All right, um, ways, uh, resources to report bullying on our GCS website, uh, let's see. If you click on a, um, this, go to the school's homepage, we have multiple ways in which um, bullying can be reported. If I can find my mouse here. Is this working? Uh, sorry. I'm trying to navigate on the website. Let me get you. While they're looking for that, if you if you go on the front page of our website, yes, that little icon right there is what pops up on the front page. All right. So it's on played just like that. To see something, say something. Um, logo. It is. Uh, we have it on several places on the uh, main site. It's right there, it's pretty prevalent when you first um, open up the district's web page. Also, if you go to Quick Links and scroll down, you'll see it in English and Spanish. It is also under the Student and Parents tab. You see something, say something icon is located there as well. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, again, you see it in English and Spanish. Also, uh, parents can go to the school's web page. I'll just uh, select one school here. And on the A.J. Wittenberg's page, again, it is right there in uh, English and Spanish. See something, say something. Um, in the top right corner, looks like a little friendly ghost. Uh, that little icon there is also to see something, say something. Uh, so what happens when parents when or students click on that? It takes them to their see something, say something page. And it goes through about uh, reporting threats, bullying, discrimination, harassment, and intimidation. Um, our board policies are linked in this page. It also has the uh, bullying hotline number here. Um, and the um, and the email address, the speak up email address. 
and again if you go down it you see links to our policy and the board rule and also the uh, complaint form and if you click on the complaint form it pulls this form up that uh, parents can fill out online and you can make an email that to the appropriate personnel And again, um, just summary of our policies says that all complaints will be investigated promptly, thoroughly, and confidentially. Um, and the investigation should take steps to uh, determine what occurred and and uh, basically how to um, how to stop that from occurring again. And also, if inappropriate conduct has taken place, then appropriate age appropriate um, action is taken at that point. Um, you see, um, again, you see uh, the report bullying and threats anonymously button here. If they click on that, they'll take them to this uh, link. Uh, they can select which school, and then the type of bullying, or the topics of bullying, cyber bullying, harassment, or threats. Then the reporter can fill in um, any pertinent information in this box. And they can attach any files if they have, uh, say, screenshots of the actual bullying taking place, things like that. They can report that. And they can simply end it at that. Or if they want to be contacted, then they can fill in their contact information that is strictly optional, or they can remain anonymous. And again, those, these, uh, this, this form will go through Gaggle and be disseminated through to the appropriate person. Also on our web page, uh, just want to show you one more thing. We have uh, an other resources for families and schools and students as well. And this uh, web page is stopbullying.gov. So on this web page, they have many resources for addressing bullying, cyberbullying, prevention, re and also resources, again, for parents, students, and schools. All right. And at that time, that's, that's my report to you. you have Thank any you, George. Yes. Um, before we get into questions, Mrs. Levinis Wells, do you have any comments you'd like to make since you put this on the agenda? Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Dr. Ward. Yes, ma'am. Have um, How many cases of bullying have we had reported this year? I do not know that answer. Okay. I'd be telling you a lie, but I can get that okay. report for you. Okay, that's fine. Um, are they more prevalent in middle school opposed to high school elementary, or which which age level are we looking at mostly? Um, and again, I, I don't have the exact numbers on that. I would say that it's... it's it's pretty probably prevalent at all levels, but to an extent, um, uh, I was a middle school principal. I know that um, there are a lot of issues that go on with middle school kids at that time, and you know, bullying has just changed to the nature of now. It's it's mostly cyber bullying, and, and as opposed to the old form of you know, yes, sir. Just threatening to take your lunch money type right. bullying. Yes, sir. Um, when parents are not satisfied, when they have brought the issue to the table, they've gone to the principal and they've gone to the next level, what, what can they do when they are not satisfied? Um, they, they have multiple levels to uh, take it. Um, like I said, if they go through the school and uh, they're not satisfied at that point, uh, the next step would be the uh, district ombudsman, and the ombudsman will take steps to um, to investigate and uh, address that issue, and then they can they will give them their findings from that point. And again, if parents still are not satisfied, then they can um, go to the next level, which would be the uh, school's uh, supervisor, the assistant superintendents who supervise the, the appropriate school at that point and uh the the appeal level goes all the way up to um dr Roster's uh designee i'm trying to ask this in a certain way um when 
students do not when that when the bullying continues and it gets to a point where it is unbearable for the child or and th it, it seems like this is more prevalent to me in the middle schools for some reason that's where i'm hearing the most of it and i'm not going to name any specific middle schools when the child decides that they can no longer take it and they they go they either go to a private school they transfer into a private school or virtual or or homeschool do we ever ask why do we ever find out exactly why they were pushed to that limit that the district could not help these children i'm hearing more and more that are at private school now that just said the bullying was just too much for our children mm -hmm. and i said really i said well we have we have things in place to assist and they said it continued once we once our child was in well this situation is just in middle school and they ended up <laughs> in the seventh grade no, sixth grade and now they are in private school seventh grade the others have been they just can't take it they thought if they could just get through uh, elementary and go to middle school it would end because those kids would go to different middle schools but it continued so what do we do for these children well I, I think that um, what we do is you know as an administration we do our best to investigate the situation thoroughly um, and to if we determine that this inappropriate uh, action is taken and a student is being bullied then there's disciplinary action that um, that is in place for the person doing the bullying um, it, it's hard to give a specific answer because all the cases are so different um, and then bullying itself becomes um, is, is not the cleanest thing such as like a fight and you get a fight is kind of easy to see a fight and you deal with it and you address it but bullying and now has taken on this form of cyber bullying and, and online things that happen outside of schools even if the school does do disciplinary action to a student uh, it can continue outside of school and out of the school's hands so we try to do that try to mitigate that as best we can and to work with the parents and give them options. Uh, sometimes they exercise the option to apply to uh, attend a different school. And when that is uh, applicable, we, we try to request to um, make that uh, happen for the parents as well. Uh, but the most part is just uh, we have resource officers in the schools uh, and try to ensure them that we're doing everything we can to protect every student in the school and make sure that um, we, we just just got to investigate thoroughly and you know and sometimes when you get into investigating bullying situations then it you investigate all of them then everything comes out and you see sometimes it's a two-way thing um, and then that becomes even more difficult to address at that point. If, if I may just yes. to, just to add one, one piece real quick this is part yes. of my training to principals and they pass it on to their staff good thank you but you know the proactive climate measures as far as um, training to, to staff members then to pass down to students talking about what bullying is and how to treat every student positively and having you know third parties come in talk about bullying could be you know some outside organization like the children's theater will come in to do it um, law enforcement will have have uh, sessions counseling uh, guidance counselors so that the positive climate is is very important and 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 also that students know how to report it um, as as dr ward has, has discussed but the climate the positive climate i think is key to also emphasize as well dr Oyster, what did you want to chime in also? Yeah, I think a uh, couple of points that we need to make. Uh, Dr. Ward made one. Oftentimes when you investigate this, you find out there is a back and forth between a student and other students, and uh, there is bullying that's taking place 
going both directions. It's not always the case, but that's often what's found. The other is, like any other concern or complaint, we can't act on, an, on anonymity. If somebody has a problem, they have to come forward and let us know they have a problem. We have, as you saw, you can go look through that formal complaint process and the process for how we handle this. We have multiple avenues if you're not satisfied with the response that you got at the school level. We need and we encourage people to follow those avenues. That's the only way you can fix a problem. You have to know specifically when it occurred, where it occurred, what actions were taken in response to it. We have students that transfer all the time. I believe, um, Greg's not in here, but I think as I recall, we have about 8,000 transfers in and out of the district every year. So we have students coming and going all the time. We often know why they leave. We often don't know why they leave. Most of them leave because they moved. But that's thousands of students every year that leave us. So we don't have necessarily a formal process in place to research why they left. Generally speaking, they will share that with the counselor or the registrar at the school. The bottom line to this and any other concern is we have to know who, what, when, where, and what took place. And we will address it. We've not failed to address any concern like that has been brought forward. But we have to know who it is and where it is in order to effectively address it. We have the process and the procedures in place. There's a very clear reporting structure. It's very easy. It's very convenient uh, to report it. You can do it with your name. You can do it without your name. But if you're not satisfied with how it's handled, we've got to know who you are and what you were not satisfied with in order to look into it and address it at whatever level it needs to be addressed. So, Mr. Webb, if a, ch if a child <laughs> had complained and ended up uh, a broken nose and it's obviously there's something going on with this male and this female child that is much smaller. How do we handle that? And, and the parents come before and say there is bullying. Sure. Well, they're the nose all is broken. We have the doctor's report. What are we doing about this? So there are a lot of measures that, that would be taken. Of course, everything would depend on this certain specific factual scenario of that situation. We would fully investigate it. Now, if, if there's some sort of possible criminal activity, mm -hmm. assault and battery, for example, law enforcement would be involved. But we would have a separate obligation in addition to law enforcement. So even if law enforcement didn't take any action, for example, we would still have to fully investigate it, come up with a plan. You know, if there's discipline, there would be appropriate discipline. If we had needed to modify student schedules to separate the students, that would be an option all kinds of different tools that are in our tool bag to, to use. Okay, so now that I put this on the schedule, here comes the other one. I need you on this. How, if a teacher is being bullied, who does the teacher report to? The employee relations representative. The, are you talking about being bullied by a student? Or by a, an adult? An adult. If the adult is someone other than the administration, then they need to report that to the administration. If it's their administration they believe is somehow bullying them, they need to report it to the employee relations representative. Or they can report it to that principal supervisor, to Mr. Reimer or uh, Dr. McDonald or Ms. Bird or Dr. Uh, Mitchell Hofer or, or uh, Ms. Lewis. Uh, it, it depends on the set of the circumstances. Sometimes you may find an accusation from a teacher who believes they're being bullied by a student. Well, that would need to go to the administration of that school to be addressed by another faculty member to the, mem to the administration of that school to be addressed. If it is by a member of the administration, not necessarily the only limited to the principal, that needs to come up here because we don't allow principals to investigate members of their own administrative staff for any purpose. And so that goes both ways. If they're being bullied by their administrator, 
than they. Ms. Lavinus Wells, I'm, I'm sorry to interject here, but you're straying off of the topic of the presentation. Well, it's bullying. But it was the presentation and the, and the direction was. I know. Level. I saw Mr. Lewis give his input. I understand. Um, so we will go ahead and um, and I, I will bring this on. An, I will bring this up for another agenda item. But the bullying on students and so forth. So basically, there is a process in place, and they report it to the principal, or they ha they can do it anonymously. But if they do it anonymously, anonymously, nothing's really going to happen. Correct? Well, the the administration, the district would investigate to the extent possible, the fullest extent possible. But if we have limited information, as far as witnesses and and who the the, the parties are, then it's going to be very difficult to po potentially investigate, but it depends on the circumstances. Sometimes that's a third party report. Right. So a person will report anonymously that uh, Dr. Ward was being bullied by Mr. Webb. That gives the administration something to investigate. They don't necessarily need the third party's identity when they have identified the two people and described the behavior. And sometimes there's video footage, for example, that if, we will If they pull. say it happened at this location at this time, if it's a commons area of the school, it's pretty easy to go back. Unless too much time has lapsed, it's pretty easy to go back and view the video to see what occurred. So anonymous reports can be effective. It is more effective when people do not report things anonymously. But we have acted on numerous occasions on anonymous reports uh, some of which proved to be credible, uh, some of which did not prove to be credible. Depends on the amount and the detail of the information provided and the nature of the circumstances. Well, I understand there are three sides to every story. Your side, my side, and the real side. And um, so thank you very much. for Thank you, Dr. Ward, for your presentation, and thank you, Mr. Webb, for your input. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Doolin. Thank you. Um, my only question is, is there a hard line drawn for what is the school's responsibility for after school bullying and what really isn't the school's responsibility, whether it be kids being ugly to each other in the neighborhood or cyberbullying after school hours? And it, is that really the school's responsibility to investigate and come up with a solution or is that really on the families or law enforcement or whoever else it it is not not a cleanly defined line we have both the authority and the responsibility if an if an issue occurs in the community that can impact the school i.e. the safety of students or the safety of faculty and staff we have not only a responsibility to investigate that and address it, but we have the, the legal authority to do so. Bullying that occurs offline, as you described it, off campus, uh, whether that be cyberbullying or neighborhood bullying, unless that impacts the safety of students at school or faculty or staff, it is an area where that line is blurred as to our responsibility and our authority to address it. Uh, we quite often have people who, who come forward and say, this student is bullying my student on some social media platform. There isn't a carryover into school. They're not addressing the student at school. They're not picking on the student at school. In fact, I can recall a specific situation when they weren't even in the same school. In fact, they were virtual students. But their bullying or their back and forth it didn't occur on our time or on our platforms. It occurred out on their own, so to speak, their own time. And it didn't carry over and affect others in the classroom setting or to any observable extent, either of them in the classroom setting. So it's difficult. There are issues that we do need to address that occur after hours and off campus that directly relate and affect the safety and security of our schools. There are others that we don't have, we have neither the authority 
nor the resources, nor should we be involved in their disputes. Uh, now, it comes to our attention, you know, I think we have an obligation to let their parents know. Uh, but other than that, it's really a case by case basis. It's not a clean, clear answer. It's an individual basis. Thank you. Mr. Suttoth. Dr. Ward. Yes, sir. Is it possible to watch the safety training video on bullying? You mean, you, you, At the beginning, you mean safety training board? videos for all staff? Yes, sir. I'd like to see those videos. Okay. All right. Yeah, we can make uh, that happen. We'll send you a link. Uh, what, Dr. Orster? We'll send you a link. Okay, be great. Uh, the second thing, Dr. Ward, uh, what board policy number is that? Bullying? Um, I believe it's uh, JCDAG. JCDAG. JC. C. Wait a minute. What are y'all? <laughs> Here, let me write it. I'll write it down. It's, write it it's down. JCDAG. Write it down. I will. Yes, sir. And the third thing, Dr. Ward, where can I get? I don't understand the components of gaggle. Where can I go to get an understanding of what is accomplished in gaggle? In, in gaggle? Yes, sir. Um, you can you can actually Google gaggle, and uh, they have a <laughs> Google gaggle. <laughs> Google gaggle. Notice I notice I didn't laugh. Three Dr. Ward. real fast. Because yes, I said that myself. Right. Once you look up uh, Gaggle, they have a, a complete website that uh, goes into what is Gaggle okay. and how is it used, and, and you'll have testimonies from other districts as well, um, and how Gaggle has affected them in uh, in their districts as well. I believe we have a committee of the whole presentation on Gaggle, going back to our first uh, uh, utilization of Gaggle. When we send you that other information, we'll set as a follow up to the meeting. We'll send you a link to the date of the Cal presentation. You might find that helpful to review. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Mrs. Wells. I, I think it's in specific schools. Um, I can uh, research that and give you the specific schools that use it, but majority of schools, it's an organization actually uh, that's been around for years um, in the uh, bullying prevention, and, um, and they also work with cyberbullying and, and all of those as well. So, because I know the, the PBIS is another program mm -hmm. Right. I wonder how many of our schools use PBS, PBIS versus some other programs. So, so I guess I was just trying to get a sense of, does every school have some specific structured way to address bullying, both in education and in um, you know, just culture? So um, uh, the PBIS model is in most of our elementary schools in some form. As you know, it varies. Um, some, some of our schools, for example, quite a few of our schools are capturing kids' hearts, um, which does also have a component that builds more, cult it's more cultural building than it is, you know, direct um, addressing bullying. But we do have um, in all of our school <laughs> programs that our counselors, our elementary, well, elementary, and middle counselors do deliver to students in the form of lesson that's part of their lesson rotation in elementary school when they go around um, on on bullying so most of our schools like that would have a pbis model of some sort they're using okay, and that's specific Conversation around bullying with our students. 
I'd, yes, they have how that's done is going to vary by the level, obviously, just because how it's set up. But like elementary, it's going to be more lessons because they rotate into the classrooms for lessons. That's not as common in middle school, but they do have whether it be through assembly, whether it be through some structured lessons throughout the year um, that they do. Um, and then in high school, you're going to see more, may see more specific programs like the stomp out bullying or some other things that the schools are promoting. Um, student, um, that's um, not as I see. Oh my gosh, what's the um, inner high? Inner high council <laughs> um, has done a couple last couple of years. They've tackled some of those problems too with some campaigns and be nice. Again, it may not be called bullying directly, but building that culture within their schools to promote culture. Right. So that's part of um, also what Ms. House, who I, I don't believe is here, I believe she's dealing with um, on a crisis team at one of our schools, but um, that's something that Ms. House does every year as well with our counselors at all levels, elementary, middle, and high, individually. I mean, each indiv individual level based on the age of the students. Um, and it is built into, very structuredly built into our um, social emotional learning um, curriculum and at the high school level, the profile of the South Carolina graduate re curriculum redo that we're working on. Um, so the data, one of my colleagues asked about the number of bullying incidents or are, what data are we collecting? Hmm. Um, what data are we collecting relative to bullying that's being reported and how it's being like, where is that data collection coming in and then who's evaluating or analyzing? that information to look at how effective our programs are. So I think at the school level, Dr. Ward might, can address kind of the operational side of it, um, you know, whether it be through referrals, obviously there's an area of referral for bullying in, in, in that kind of area. For our counselors though, um, it's certainly, most of the time I would say with our counseling, my experience has been that it's being it's being, I guess, delivered, you know, somebody says they're being bullied and that counselor may, that child may get a referral and may be disciplined for that. But then it's also, we try to intervene as well from a, not just a discipline side, but also from a counseling side. If that behavior is continuing, why is that behavior continuing? And is there some additional help we can get that student? Yeah, and like I said, I'm just kind of, we've got all this, if gaggles coming in and we're getting all these responses, there should be a way to kind of parse out that data and think well, about, is. you know, is it, are we seeing it more in middle school? So should there be more intentionality or a more structured program in all or, or a middle school? So, because we did, Gaggle was like 21, right? When we, we bought it a year. I think it was 2021, 20, 20, I think. 21, so not quite a full year yet. Uh, yeah. So just kind of thinking about that, how do we use that data to inform our practices yeah, so with regard to bullying and what we have to do there? Yes, and we and we do um, we we purchased that in uh, July, I believe, of twenty. Um, so we've had you know a few years, and so one of the things Miss House and we've done with Miss Dean before we had Miss House is pulling some of those actual gaggle alerts that we get, working through counselors in their sessions about you know how would you handle the situation. So if it's bullying, how would you handle the situation? What would be your next steps as a counselor? Which would hopefully be you know we're trying to get the counselors trained in Miss Wells was bullying, accused of bullying for the third time, somebody. Let's now intervene with her from a counseling level, not just being a discipline a discipline level of suspending her. Um, because to your point, ultimately you want to see those numbers go down, but there has to be some sort of intervention, particularly in the bullying area. Right, and it might be, I mean, it might be individual, but it also Correct. might need to be this broader. Right, yes. right. and uh, again, we only have the year's worth of data to look at, but we can, I can get with uh, Travis Forrester on the reports that we do get from Gaggle and see how we are able to um, I guess drill down into those numbers and identify which levels has the most bullying and um, provide those numbers for you. Is that so now Gaggle captures, even if something comes in through the website, it goes to Gaggle, right? So we are able to capture and classify yes. all those. Yes. Okay. Um, so the. Uh, Ms. Wells, if I could, please. 
Yeah, just two right. little things. Um, without objection, I'd like to extend for five minutes. So, so just related to the anonymous threats, I certainly understand that, I understand why someone would want to report anonymously, and I understand why it's difficult for an anonymous report to be investigated. So when I went and clicked on where it says report bullying and threats anonymously and I look at the form, the form doesn't give, it doesn't give specifics about what are all the things you need to know in order to investigate. So I guess one thing I would say is to sort of answer, to, to sort of answer to some questions around or, or some concerns about, well, I reported something anonymously and it never got, nothing ever happened maybe we could, uh, an improvement would be to kind of better set up that form so that we're specific in, if you're reporting anonymously, here are the specifics we need so that, because if they don't give their, their contact information, then you can't even go back and ask if you're reporting anonymously, still I need this information. So just something there. And then when you look at the part where it tells you how to contact, if it's with the administration and it tells you how to contact the board or the um, ombudsman, it links you to the policy, and the policy gives you the general phone number, and you can mail your concerns. So I guess I would just think that and instead of saying on this page to see the policy for the contact information, maybe there's a better way, because that just feels like if you click on a policy and then you have to go look and you see the general phone number and a mailing address and no email, it just might feel like um, and, and then my other part there is, can we put this, can we pin it on our Facebook page in addition to like the bullying, the see something, say something? Can we pin it to our, I don't know who does it. Like we could pin it to our social media page just like we have on our website because a lot of people go get their content about Greenville County Schools now from our Facebook page. Um, that was just another suggestion. I, I have heard from people who, you know, they've contacted me and said, I don't know how to deal with this and so there's those general things you always say that you report it to your teacher and then your principal and you work up those but when it's bullying that just a lot of people are very hesitant to just handle it through those channels so the easier we can make it for people to know how important it is to us for them to see something and say something I think the better off we're going to be so I'd be really interested in how y'all use that data to help inform our programs. Thank you for the presentation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Saylor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Ward, thank you very much for that presentation. And we'll now move to item 4.02, 4 revision of policy IHC, credit and content recovery. Uh, a, there is a motion, there's a recommended motion from the administration uh, Dr. Royster, do you have a presentation prior to that? Uh, really, the, <clears throat> the presentation is simply this brings this policy in alignment with current statute, current State Board of Education regulation and State Department requirements, and also ensures that uh, we address NCAA requirements. Uh, Mr. Webb, is there anything of particular note uh, other than all these changes are simply to align us with the requirements? That's correct. I, I worked with academics, Mr. McCoy, to, to make sure that our policy reflects current regs and requirements, and this just brings us up up okay. to that requirement. And the chair will entertain a motion to approve the recommendation, Mr. Meek. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion to approve the revisions to policy to board policy <coughs> IHC. I would love to second. Not just enthusiastically, but I'd love, just love to. to okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have a motion properly made and duly seconded. Uh, we're now open for discussion. Uh, Mr. Lewis. Thanks. Uh, just two questions about the revision. So one of them says um, all credit recovery courses will be instructed by certified and highly qualified teachers in their respective content areas, and that sentence has been struck out. So is there is there a reason why that that sentence is no longer? 
correct? It has to do more with the way um, credit recovery and content recovery has changed over the last couple of years. Um, well, last five or six years, they still have to have a um, highly qualified um, certified teacher of record. But because of the way those platforms have changed, they're not quote unquote instructing. Um, the students, as you know, are going through those course, going through that coursework. The student, the teacher rather, is there <laughs> to assist in tutoring, to help the child if they need additional help. Um, in the early days when we first built this, it was more of instruction though than anything else. So because the instruction is being provided by a different source, the person providing it locally Correct. doesn't have to be highly qualified. Okay. The other question is just, could you just provide a little bit of clarity about the student athlete section? So it's uh, essentially, it sounds like we're saying, just so you know, the NCAA may not may not accept your. Correct. It's it's something we've always um, verbally communicated it into in, in most on most of the forms as well from the high schools that went home, but. Um, it's something that has been an issue in the past where students even sometimes didn't realize they were going to be eligible for a sport later on or wasn't interested until later on in their high school career, but they had a credit recovery in their in their ninth grade year for some reason. Um, it just depends. The NCAA is pretty, um, they don't um, yet recognize, in most cases, the credit recovery programs. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Mrs. Wells. Just, just to clarify, on the content recovery, we. That is something that we are we specifically offer only in an in a. It's not a direct instruction when we're doing content recovery, right? Because we have this. So content recovery is a little different. There's a lot of different ways that can be done. It's a very broad term. Um, it could really be you just failed a test, and you go back to the teacher, and teacher provides different instruction, more instruction, allows you to retake that a different test to to, to, to you know review that content. It could also be longer term. Typically how we've been using it is if a child's struggling four weeks into the course, we a lot of times will use content recovery to help them recover the credit, well, help recover the content before they fail that course. So it's a little bit of a broad term, the content recovery piece. Okay, so when we say content recovery options will be available through either an approved system provided by the state or an approved vendor, we're specifically talking there about content recovery instructional options. Yes, and teachers do have the option through our Edgenuity program. They have, and many most utilize that, they have the option to pull out um, pieces of that program to assign to you activity-wise to help you recover that content. It just helps, it just helps the teacher having to, prevent, um, to make up, you know, new activities or new content because they want to change it, obviously, to make sure you've mastered it. They can use that system to do so. Okay. And I guess, so just, it is kind of confusing and, and it's morphed, I know, over time, but Correct. when we say students shall be eligible to enroll in content recovery, that is if they're in, enrolling in a instructional. Correct. Uh, it, right. That you almost have to think of as it's, it, that's a double, for those kids who are really struggling, it's almost a double dip of the class. It's, we realize you're struggling, we're going to move you into an enrolled content recovery, so you're still going to the English 2 class, but you're also going then to an, um, a content recovery class and almost getting that double instruction. And so this is kind of specific to not just con content recovery that right. we're doing, we might be doing with students one-on-one -on -one with a teacher, Correct. but the content recovery course. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And Thank I believe, you. Jeff, it has to be simultaneous with Correct. the duration of the course and there is a deadline established by the state by which it must end. Yeah, the content so recovery. Yeah, content recovery really has to align, align with the course. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Hearing none, the motion has been properly made and duly seconded. All those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? And motion carries. Thank you. Next item of business and order is item 4.03, the uh, certification of the delegates for the South Carolina School Board Association Conference. Um, the recommended motion is stated. Is there a maker? Mr. Chairman, I make, I make a motion to certify the slate of delegates with each trustee named as both a delegate and an alternate, and with the vice chair assigned three votes and the remaining trustees two votes each. Second. I have a motion made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Next item of business and order is item 4.04, .04, the nomination of the South Carolina School Board Association Region 15 Director. 
There is a recommended motion. Is there a maker? Mrs. Wells? I'd like to nominate Glenda Morrison Fair for the office of SCSBA Region 15 Director, effective November 8th, 2022. Second. Second. I have a motion made and properly seconded to nominate Mrs. Glenda Morrison Fair for the office of the South Carolina School Board Association Region 15 Director, effective November the 8th, 2022. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as stated, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. God bless you, Glenda, for doing that. And Mr. Chairman, we are complete with the administration portion of today's agenda. Thank you, Mr. Sailors. Our next item on the agenda is building and grounds. Ms. Doolin. Hey, facilities and project report. Mr. Carlin. Yes, ma'am, I don't have a specific presentation, but would be glad to answer any questions you have. Uh, Mr. Lewis. At the last meeting, we had some questions about the new elementary school at the old J.L. Mann site. Do we have an update on the progress of that project? Uh, we are in discussions currently with the city of Greenville as well as SEDOT about their requirements. Um, the current uh, buy to handle all off right road, off site road, uh, upgrades that they um, are indicating that we are going to be required to do with this project. It's about $8.8 million, which uh, we strongly uh, oppose being required to provide that much of a contribution. Uh, so we are still in those conversations right now. Um, well, more specifically, I met with the city manager of the city of Greenville the week following our being informed of the $8 million in traffic circles uh, that were being imposed on us as necessary for traffic flow around the school. Um, we also have reached out and been confirmed to meet with uh, number two person to SCDOT. They asked that we defer that meeting until they had completed dealing with the hurricane. You know, it came through right about that same time. Uh, we've reached back out to them to schedule that meeting. Our position on that is we, we certainly understand and have no problem with uh, doing road improvements to ingress and egress from school sites. We've had that responsibility for a number of years. Customarily, we pay part of that. The local road funds uh, used to be called a C funds. We don't call it that anymore but what used to be the seed funds committee, they would normally contribute and we would contribute. For a project like this, we've ordinarily budgeted between quarter, three quarter of a million and a million dollars for our contribution. That was the original amount that we budgeted for this, uh, right at a million dollars. We submitted uh, traffic studies uh, that confirmed that we needed to do work around the ingress and egress from the property including realigning uh, the entry drive uh, to a driveway across or an access street across the road from the school site. We submitted that to DOT. We received approval, preliminary approval from Mark Falk, who is the DOT person for the state of South Carolina for school traffic. Following that, we received further communication in fact, in that communication, referencing a conversation between the local DOT and the city of Greenville, imposing upon us the requirement that we construct two traffic circles, one of which is adjacent to our property, one of which is not, in order to mitigate traffic in the area. We believe that is not the responsibility of the school or the school district to mitigate traffic caused by development in that area. We certainly agree with the responsibility to address the traffic that we are bringing into that and our ingress and egress from the property. So I shared those concerns with uh, Mr. McDonough at the city of Greenville. He seemed receptive to those concerns. We, are, we have shared them ahead of the meeting with SCDOT. They seem receptive to those concerns. We're simply waiting now to get a meeting and some answer. One of the responses from Mr. McDonald when I talked with him uh, that Friday was he needed some period of time to come back to us with what they might 
be willing to contribute to such an effort or what they might do to uh, perhaps consider changing that recommendation. Uh, it, that would be unprecedented for us to spend $8 million on traffic mitigation. So we're holding, we've got that project on hold. We also have engaged our realtor to go out and look for sites in the vicinity, but outside the city of Greenville. We can purchase a site for far less than we could spend $8 million on traffic circles. But we're gonna to need to move from the area we're in to an area a little further away in order to do that. Uh, but we, we're not gonna let that prevent us from doing what we need to do to address growth. Now, in either respect, whether we go forward on that site or we go forward with a new site and simply site adapt our design to it, this delay will cause us to move the school opening to, to uh, by one year to uh, 24. 2025, 20, sir. 25, I'm sorry, from 24 to 25. Uh, it, when we first looked at this issue, talked with Greg Stanfield and he affirmed to us there is no, he has no issue as far as overcrowding at schools with us moving this project out. Now, that would be a different story with those, we've got about five, six additions. It feels very strongly those need to progress forward as they, as they are in their own time. Uh, but that this is not critical at this point to address uh, student growth. So that that's in summary where we are. And when we get some firm response back from the city of Greenville and SCDOT, we'll certainly share that with you as soon as we receive it. So just to say back a few things to make sure that, that I heard them correctly. So one is we are, we are looking at what, what jumped from a $1 million infrastructure cost to an $8.8 .8 million cost that this board has not allocated funds to cover in our long range facility plan. So we, we could not at this point pay the additional $7 million in road construction costs without this board making a change to its long range facility. Plan. It's an $8 million increase. And first, I don't think we would recommend that to you. Mm -hmm. Secondly, to your point, you would need to approve that and identify $8 million more million in uh, allocation to construct that school. Uh, so now there would be a cost of acquiring a new site, but it would nowhere approach $8 million. And the, the second thing I, th I think I heard you say, so the current plan is for this school to open in August 2024. I think you said last month, if, if we don't start construction really soon, then I think I heard you say by November, then we could not stay on track. So you're, you're currently projecting that we likely will not be on track, even if that problem is resolved in the next month. Unless to, somebody gave us a decision today that it wasn't going to cost us any additional mm -hmm. from two different entities, we'd need that decision within the next probably 10 days. If we don't get that, then we're a year out. And the, the third question that, that I've been asked is this, this site plan included a new elementary school and it also included facility improvements to high school athletic spaces that were also on that space mm -hmm. that needed to be moved around to accommodate the new elementary school. Based on, based on what we're talking here, I assume that means those athletic improvements are also on hold. And yes. That, and that the cost for those athletic improvements is tied to this school being constructed on this site. That is, that is correct. And some of that, the majority of that had to do with relocating fields that were already on the site that are, that are fully serviceable as they are. And so should we move this site to another location, then a new softball field, um, a new lacrosse field? I mean, a lot of those new improvements that were planned as a part of this site, I assume, are also on hold until all of that gets resolved and may not be done with these dollars because we would, I assume, need those dollars to build a new elementary school at a different location. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sailors. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Dr. Royster or Colonel Cardinal, either one, just to clarify. <clears throat> If we were to relocate this school facility to another piece of property, would the intention be to do any additional adjustments to the current athletic complex at jail now? No, sir. Not unless we've identified some maintenance-related issue that's necessary for safety or equity. Okay. 
Uh, so just to be clear and so everyone again understands, I believe the most we've spent for infrastructure related to streets and roads, egress to the building and access to the building property was Fountain Inn High School, which is a little over a million dollars. Yes, sir. I believe it was 1.3. 1 1.7. 1 1.7. But that's the most we've ever spent. Yes, sir. And we also got, I believe, the largest we've ever gotten from, I'll say the wrong GLDTC. Thing. GLD, <laughs> GLDTC. TC. Used to be seed funds. Easier okay. to remember seed funds. Okay. We got the largest amount we've ever received from them. Yes, sir. So since the time that the school system vacated J.L. Mann High School sitting on that property. And today, the only development that's been done in that greater community has been residential related for the most part. Am I correct? Some commercial, in, but mostly residential. In the immediate vicinity of the school, on this side, the Greenville side of the interstate, I'm not aware of any development that's occurred that's different from what was there. The apartments behind the old jail man were already there. The houses in that neighborhood were already there. Now, there have been some additions on the other side of the interstate, commercial-related property. I believe that St. Joseph's has, I believe it's expanded in that period of time to some degree. Some of those vacant commercial properties are now being utilized. There's been more commercial development uh, along the road that J.L. Mann fronts on that runs all the way back to Butler Road. But really, as far as on the school side of the interstate, there's really not been much change so in there. So in simple terms, the city of Greenville is asking us to help them with traffic problems that we have no control over and had nothing to do with their development. I, I believe that's a, a very accurate assessment. Now, obviously, we're going to put some traffic in there with that school. Well, we had 1,500, 1500 cars there when it was a high school. We had a far larger number of cars there when we were using the property as a high school, to your point, than we will have at an elementary school. Then one last question. Um, has anyone identified that if we have to move off of this site and relocate somewhere else and purchase another site, if we were to segregate what is now the athletic the, the, the athletic competition fields at man from this piece of property that's just green space for now, uh, has anybody put a dollar value to what that space would be worth? Because quite frankly, I'm of the opinion if we've got to go somewhere and buy a piece of property, that chunk of ground needs to be sold to somebody to build houses on or whatever because the taxpayers of Greenville County have no business paying for a lacrosse practice field. Uh, no, sir. We haven't put a, a precise number on that or looked at that. Uh, it, it would substantially fund a site acquisition if you if you trimmed off just that portion of that property. Well, if we have to relocate the school, I'm going to request that an appraisal be done to take the portion that we don't really need for J.O. Mann's direct athletic competition and put that and get a, give us a price on what it would cost or what it would be valued at if we chose <clears throat> to sell it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Without objection, can we extend for 10 minutes, please? Uh, Ms. Wells. I think the um, the city limits of Greenville and Malden butt up to each other, right? And so I think all the development in that vicinity really has come technically in the city of Malden, but it's been a ton of apartment complexes and there's a lot of multifamily housing, you know, right just as you go down Lawrence Road heading, heading toward Malden, right if you pass the jail man intersection there. Um, as I understand it, the the traffic, they don't have traffic issues currently that they have to deal with. That's probably a projection five years out that they'll have a need. And so I guess that's kind of the, you know, the rub is building infrastructure to support the school ahead of 
you know, when we need it. So um, it, it sounds like that's moving forward and we're trying to come to some conclusion on that one way or the other. I, I guess I would ask back to your point about these other schools, the other additions that are gonna be, that are needed, um, they're all, they all come to existing schools, not new schools, which is good because we haven't, you know, I think it's hard for us to really get a gauge, a good gauge on what, what infrastructure costs look like right now because thankfully we haven't had to build a lot of new schools to date. We've been able to add on to a lot of schools. So, you know, Fountain Inn was 1.7 for, for those improvements. I, I think that's probably, there's a trend there that that number is going to go up. So I guess I would just like to ask, you know, there's all these additions, there's in the southern part of the county and in the northern part of the county. So you're not dealing with an urban setting um, where you probably are more constrained and more likely to immediate feel, immediately feel some traffic um, woes. But are we actively, have we actively looked in detail at traffic impacts? I think those are mostly state That'd be state and county roads that when you look at Ellen, Woodside, Fork Shoal, Simpsonville, Simpsonville, is that county road or is that city? Ma'am, I'm not sure I'd have to find out for you. Okay. But so, I can tell you we have been been uh, heavily involved with traffic consulting looking at each of those addition sites to determine what the per, <clears throat> what the perceived traffic impacts will be and what our requirements will be to accommodate those. Yeah. And I would say just going a step further and and to to Dr. Worcester's concern about you know what 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 is our impact, but yet it's not our infrastructure. Getting some people to come to the table early or as soon as possible to say the growth is happening, the the impact is gonna be here because the, the people are here and we're about to add more space for more of them to come to our location so that they can get funding, you know, with the funding they have right now that that committee has to work with, it seems like it'd be a great time to go look for even enhancements beyond what, what they want, but what we feel like we need for pedestrian safety and for connectivity. Um, Cause what I don't know about is how traffic circles, I don't know that, any, that they would recommend traffic circles at any of those locations, just kind of look, looking about, looking at them and thinking about it. but. There's an impact to connectivity and pedestrian safety when you have traffic circles that you have to be really attentive to. And I think that's a probably a problem to address and think about with this new elementary school, if it stays on that site, but then also looking at all those other schools. So I, I guess it sounds like we've got our folks working on it or we've got engineers working for us on our side, but you know, maybe in conversations about what happens for this school to be sure we're getting them to think about how they can go improve the infrastructure ahead of us needing that or them triggering a need for us to have those improvements would be something I think would be, you know, could be helpful for us as a district in the long run. That's it. Uh, Mr. Meek. Thank you, um, Dr. Royster. The the new JL Man Elementary School is a relief school. Is that what it was intended to be? Uh, it's relief and future growth. Future growth where? Predominantly the Verde community in that area, which Verde the, the Verde development uh, is on almost directly behind this site on the other side of Lawrence Road part of which has been developed, but there is still a huge undeveloped area within Verde. And also, uh, I believe it was Ms. Wells that mentioned, there's multifamily housing that's been constructed just beyond the main entrance to ICAR on and along Lawrence Road. <coughs> and we do not have a elementary school near the Verde I car area is that correct the closest schools that serve that area uh would be sarah collins when you think about where it is in relation to that site and those developments they're also zoned to pelham road malden elementary school seems to me like philip there's a fourth one is there not 
we may have to get that to you. But you, you can see by the, there's not one closer than the ones I just mentioned to you. And Sarah Collins is close to capacity. Uh, Pelham Road, it's not right at capacity, but it's closing in on that. And it's not very proximate to Verde. And Malden Elementary School is certainly not very proximate to Verde. Bethel, I believe, may be the other one. that I think Bethel has perhaps some of those multifamily that's right along Lawrence Road. So when they were developing ICAR, did they not have talks about having a school within that uh, facility? Well, you know, we put Fisher in there. Okay, and that was the only one. It was That's the only final. one. And as you may recall, while it's been several years ago, we were able to acquire that property really through the generosity of the developer who sold it to us at about 50% of its market value, then received tax benefits for the rest of it. Otherwise, it, that would have been a probably out of our price range, so to speak, to, to put a site in there. Then we did have some additional design considerations that you have to meet within ICAR. Uh, so to look, and, and we had a short discussion about that in relation to a site there as opposed to if we moved off of the JL Mann site, we felt like it was too expensive in there to both purchase the property and the design requirements the ICAR uh, property itself would impose upon us. So we wanted to look outside of ICAR, but in that vicinity. Okay. Buena Vista. But it was a it was a chain reaction and coming down through there like like from Woodland and from other schools I believe if I remember correctly but right and and to, to pull some away from that and and back into that new school and of course we're talking about a piece of property that was probably one of the that's probably the largest undeveloped tract in the city of Greenville the Verde property so there there was there was nothing there when we we moved out of old J O man there were, there were at that point, there were no houses in that track. You, you mentioned that you have a somebody looking at other proper property. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I will. Have we have we found a spot already? Not, not yet, no sir. We have not found a spot, no sir. Would is any consideration done to instead of putting the school on JL Mann's side as a relief school, putting it? in a different direction where the school still could, uh, it could still be a relief school, but going away from the jail man Malden area. Uh, you know, you'd have to look at a map, I'm sure. Well, anything coming back this way, there is less available large pieces of property. So if you imagine jail man being here and the city of Greenville being here, anything coming this way, less available acreage going the the Malden direction which is literally going right under the right under the interstate mm -hmm. there is more available acreage there uh, we actually even had a conversation with Hollingsworth about some property in Verde but their their plan wouldn't allow for a space near large enough for an elementary school site and I believe you heard that and, and I don't recall ever having a situation to this where, where the SDOT and the cities requiring the district to put out as much money as, as the proposal is now. Well, I think two things there. First, I do not recall a single circumstance where SDOT came back after we got initial approval from Mark Falk, who is their school traffic person, and imposed any additional requirement on us at all. I do not recall any circumstance in my now 17 years in the district. Okay, my next question. Um... Oh, wait, without objection, can we extend for 10 more minutes, please? Don't take me that long. <laughs> Mr. Webb. Is there any circumstance where a motion can be put on the floor? End of this. Okay. 
in this item today. Since it's from the committee, the whole, and would not be final action, then it would go back to requiring unanimous consent of the board members present. So you, there, are, there are not concerns re, regarding the Freedom of Information Act because there would have to be a subsequent action, final action, in two weeks. But you would still have to have uni, unanimous consent to add it to the agenda. So I would need a unanimous consent before I make a motion to make the motion. Yes, you you would you could make the the motion, and then there would have to be unanimous consent to get it on there, and then there would be a separate vote to vote it up or down. If that makes sense. Okay, Madam Chairman. I'd like to make a motion that we give the administration the authority to follow through, if necessary, to find a different site for the JL Mann Elementary School. Okay, do we need a second? Mm -hmm. All right, and then we need to vote to allow this motion? That, that is correct, So, and it has to be unanimous to, to allow it, and then there will be a second vote if that passes. Is so, there any discussion about allowing this? Okay. So go ahead. All right, well then, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. That would not be unanimous, sorry. Mr. That would not be unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have any more questions? I do not. Um, okay, Ms. Lopez Wells. So basically, what we were doing with the JL Mann Elementary School, the new one, is we were accommodating the residents that are living in that surrounding area so that it would minimize their travel time and have their students in a location that would be easily accessible. Is that correct? Yes, for a, I, I only qualify it slightly, for a large percentage of what we envision the future student population to be. So the area immediately around the school, yes, which would be single family housing, kind of to the front of it, right. multifamily behind it, then the housing that has been built and is being built in Verde. Right, and having taught there, I certainly understand, I don't understand why they need the circular. Uh, and, and I'm sure this was all discussed prior to making this decision. The first time we heard about traffic circles was this summer. When we went to DOT the very first time for initial approval to use the site, never mentioned it. We conducted a third party traffic study, which we're required to do. In fact, I think they actually did three different takes on that study, two or three, Colonel. It was multiple. Uh, multiple traffic. So, so catching traffic multiple times. Uh, our initial return from our third party traffic engineer said, here's what needs to, here's what you need to do. SCDOT via Mark Falk said, I agree with that. We're ready to move forward. That was within eight tenths of a million dollars. So $800,000. Then Following that, we received a subsequent communication that we'll be glad to send you a copy of that in writing that says SCDOT, in conversation with the city of Greenville, has determined <coughs> that there needs to be two traffic circles. We put an estimate on that. Then we got Cotransco, Co the county's transportation people, to give us an independent estimate, The two, actually the two align. That's another $8 million. We've never been asked to do a traffic mitigation at that level of any project through the best program uh, and from the best program going forward. And because of that curve thrown in, now we are looking at most likely moving that school further out. Un unless somebody's going to come back to us and say, well, we don't think you need that anymore or we don't believe it's your responsibility to do so, or there'd be some minimal additional cost. 
Well, let's just hope that they will reevaluate their decision and act on it very promptly so that the residents in, in Hollingsworth and the surrounding area will have an elementary school that will be available for their children. Thank you, Dr. Royster. All right, with, oh, Ms. Wells. Well, I guess just the schools that are around that vicinity, Sterling is one of those as well. Do we have a... Do we have an addition? Do we do we build Sterling to be able to be added? I don't believe there's capacity on that current property to add to Sterling. I believe that Sterling on the elementary side is close to full. We have spaces, we have seats available on the GT side. We all, we added seats, didn't physically add seats. We opened up seats. I don't believe they've ever fully moved to the amount that we increased them to. It seemed to me like we increased them to 90 seats per grade, and I don't believe they've ever quite reached 90 seats. I, I just, I know we have, we have this, the middle school fields behind us, so there's a lot of property there. I just didn't know, I couldn't remember if we built <coughs> with the idea that there'd be, that there could be an addition well, off the back or the not. The back of uh, Sterling runs up to uh, the Phyllis Wheatley Center property on, on kind of one, right. sort of one half of the back of the property. The other runs right up against Swamp Rabbit Cove. Right on the other side of the field. Yeah, on the other side of the fields. Yep. Okay. So that that was my question. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With, oh, Miss Bush. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. We may need to extend time again. Okay. I have it. Just a technicality. Okay. I'm going to challenge our attorney in the ruling earlier on so if we have some <laughs> so, so if we have something that is on our agenda that says for information only we have to have unanimous consent to make a motion unless, unless there's advance notice prior to the meeting then then the, the vote changes back to majority vote I believe but if if the agenda item is not already on there and it's the day of and and made at a committee of the whole meeting then there needs to be unanimous consent and this wouldn't be considered to be on our agenda an update on the facility not not specific enough mrs bush i'm i'm sorry right so it's that specificity and plus it's for information only too so i think that also um infers to say the least that there's not an actual action item on it uh, and that and that adds a little bit more clarity to it sure. because i was just because we have an item earlier that was the impact of recess and that says it's for information only, but then it says on there, unless the administration has one to suggest, but it's because of the specificity of that item. That's correct. And not that. So if this board wanted to take action, it needs to be put on the next board meeting that we could take action to be able to allow the administration uh, a little bit more urgency in, in in the negotiations that are going on that are delaying a elementary school being built by a year. Yes. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay, that concludes the building and grounds section of this, Mr. Meek. Thank you, Ms. Dillon. Uh, before I ask for a motion to adjourn, I want to remind you that we do have a workshop. Uh, let's try to get back here about 12.45. So I have a motion to adjourn. I have a, mo have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. aye. All opposed say no. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you. That's the reason. <laughs> 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 <laughs>